The woman known to history as Hatshepsut was born in ancient Egypt in approximately 1507 BC. Her father was Thutmose I, a pharaoh of the 18th dynasty who ruled mainly from the city of Thebes, which is now in the modern city of Luxor on the River Nile, 500 miles south of the Mediterranean Sea. Thutmose I was a renowned military leader and oversaw the vast expansion of the ancient Egyptian empire eastwards into the Levant and southwards into Nubia, now northern Sudan and southern Egypt. He was likely the son of the previous pharaoh Amenhotep I and a secondary wife, but the Egyptians did not create family trees, so identifying blood relations can be difficult. Her mother was Ahmose, the principal wife of Thutmose I, but it is not known who Ahmose's parents were, although it is highly likely that she was born into the royal family. Egyptologists have argued that she was the daughter of Pharaoh Amenhotep I, making her the sister and wife of Thutmose, something that was common within the royal family. However, she was never given the title of king's daughter. Instead, she was referred to as the king's sister, suggesting she was the sister of either Amenhotep or Thutmose. Ahmose and her husband Thutmose I had two daughters, the eldest of whom was Hatshepsut, and no surviving sons, which would become a problem for the dynasty. Hatshepsut was only the second historically confirmed woman to rule Egypt with the full titles and power of a pharaoh. She belonged to the 18th dynasty, which ran from 1507 BC to 1458 BC, and she ruled for over two decades, from 1478 BC to 1458 BC. Hatshepsut lived over 3,500 years ago, and to put into perspective how long the period of ancient Egyptian history is, Hatshepsut lived over 1,000 years after the building of the Pyramids of Giza and 100 years before Tutankhamun, 200 years before Ramesses, and 1,400 years before the most famous female pharaoh Cleopatra. Little is known about Hatshepsut's childhood, but her name, which means foremost of noble ladies, highlighted her prominent position within the royal family. She certainly would have had important royal duties to fulfill, including being involved in religious rituals. She is known to worship the cow goddess Hathor in particular, who was the goddess of love, beauty, music, dancing, fertility and pleasure, and was also the protector of women. There were 42 state gods and goddesses in total in the ancient Egyptian religion, the most important of which was Amun-Ra, the sun god, creator, who was later seen as king of the gods. As the eldest daughter of the pharaoh, Hatshepsut would have been expected to marry the next pharaoh, a tradition which aimed to keep the royal bloodline pure. And so, at around the age of 12, she married her half-brother Thutmose II, becoming his principal wife. As Thutmose II was younger than Hatshepsut, she perhaps took over the reins of power in her husband's name when their father, Thutmose I, died in 1493 BC. By the time Hatshepsut came to full power in around 1478 BC, Egypt, as a unified country, was already 17 centuries old, as legendary king Menes had first ruled a unified Egypt in around 3100 BC. As it is today, the land of ancient Egypt was made habitable by the River Nile, which cut through the desert and gave the names to the two regions of Egypt, Upper Egypt, which was upriver in the south, and Lower Egypt, downriver in the north, around the Nile Delta region. The king or pharaoh ruled both regions, with the title of King of Upper and Lower Egypt, Lord of the Two Lands. But there were distinct differences between the two areas. They had different protector goddesses, Nechbet, the vulture goddess in Upper Egypt, and Wadjet, the cobra goddess in Lower Egypt. The regions were also represented by different symbols, the lotus for the upper and the papyrus for the lower, which were often tied together to symbolize unity. In those periods when Upper and Lower Egypt were united, there was huge prosperity and astonishing cultural achievement. They were true golden ages. The first golden age occurred during the period of the Old Kingdom, 2649 BC to 2100 BC. This was the age of the pyramids, 
Disintegration and competing dynastic families brought this golden age to a temporary end, a period called the First Intermediate Period from 2181 BC to 2055 BC. The Middle Kingdom from 2030 BC to 1650 BC was the Second Golden Age, a time when Egyptian culture and literature flourished. This period of growth had begun with the reunification of Upper and Lower Egypt by Mentuhotep II. However, the beginning of the end of the Middle Kingdom was caused by a break in the royal line. Female pharaoh Sobek Neferu died in 1802 BC without any heirs, resulting in the collapse of the successful 12th dynasty. The next two dynasties, which overlapped, proved weak. The 13th dynasty was forced to retreat southwards towards Memphis and failed to prevent a breakaway dynasty forming. The breakaway 14th dynasty reigned separately over the Nile Delta region simultaneously. The Second Intermediate Period from 1650 BC to 1550 BC, which followed, saw Egypt once again divided. In the north, the Hyksos dynasty arrived from Western Asia, and its six kings ruled as the 15th dynasty. In the south, the Kingdom of Kush, an early civilization in the region of Nubia, northern Sudan, expanded its reach. In the middle sat the Egyptian Kingdom of Thebes, or the 16th dynasty and the 17th dynasty. It was during the 17th dynasty that war was launched against Hyksos rule, who were eventually pushed out of Egypt by the Thebans of the 17th dynasty. It was at this time that Upper and Lower Egypt were reunited by Ahmose I of Thebes in 1550 BC and the Third Golden Age began. This brought ancient Egypt full circle, as another Theban, Mentuhotep II, had united Upper and Lower Egypt at the start of the Middle Kingdom too, also triggering a Golden Age. In reunifying the country, Ahmose became the founder of the New Kingdom and the first king of the 18th dynasty, to which Hatshepsut also belonged. As the period of foreign rule in Egypt came to an end, Egypt began to build up its own empire. During the Second Intermediate Period, the Kushites had raided the south, prompting the Egyptians to expand further south into Nubia. The Kingdom of Kush was firmly pushed back under Hatshepsut's father Thutmose I around 1500 BC, and the earlier defeat of the Hyksos during the Second Intermediate Period saw the new Kingdom of Egypt expand into the Levant. It was during this time, just before Hatshepsut's reign, that the Egyptian Empire attained its greatest territorial extent. Hatshepsut was directly related to these empire-expanding pharaohs. As well as her father, Thutmose I, Hatshepsut was a blood relation of Ahmose I, the unifier of Upper and Lower Egypt and the first ruler of the New Kingdom. But although they came from the same dynasty, tracing their family connections is difficult. Ahmose I's son, Amenhotep I, was his successor. But after that, the historical record becomes unclear. Amenhotep I was succeeded by Thutmose I, but Thutmose never used the title King's Son, which puts a question mark over his connection to Amenhotep. Some Egyptologists have argued that Thutmose's wife, Ahmose, was Amenhotep's sister, making Thutmose his son-in-law rather than biological son. Or he might have been Amenhotep's son, born of a lesser wife, which would have restricted his use of the title King's Son. It is also possible that Thutmose was a general chosen by the heirless Amenhotep to rule. However, a violent coup can be ruled out as an explanation, as the records suggest a peaceful transition of power occurred. Dynastic problems did not come to an end after the accession of Thutmose I. A recurring issue was that sons born to secondary wives and any female children were not considered ideal heirs. Thutmose I and his principal wife Ahmose had no surviving son, only two daughters, of whom Hatshepsut was the oldest. Thutmose I did have a son, Thutmose II, with a secondary wife, Mutnofret, and it was thought best, according to tradition, that Thutmose II be quickly married to his half-sister, Hatshepsut. This would bolster the credentials of Thutmose II and preserve the direct royal line. Egyptologists of the past have presented Thutmose II as weak and frail, 
This presentation was not necessarily rooted in fact, it was fueled by a determination to present Hatshepsut as domineering. A shrewd Hatshepsut was supposed to have manipulated her ineffective husband and essentially ruled in his name. However, public monuments paint a different picture. A dutiful Hatshepsut is shown standing behind her husband, showing appropriate fealty to him as the pharaoh. But the limited scale of Thutmose II's building program hinders a deeper understanding of his reign and the power his wife held. Thutmose II ruled only for a short time after his father's death. He was succeeded by his wife and half-sister Hatshepsut. For the same reason, he himself had almost been passed over, the lack of a son born of the principal wife. Just like his father, Thutmose II did have a son with a secondary wife, Isis. This child, Thutmose III, could not immediately take the throne because he was very young. And like with the accession of Thutmose II, there was some concern over the child's status as the son of a secondary wife. The weakening of the direct royal line was a concern that could not be easily overlooked. Instead, as tradition indicated, Hatshepsut was to rule as co-regent for the young boy, a role which soon grew to that of a co-ruler. There had been precedents of widowed principal wives ruling as regents and dutifully handling the affairs of the government for their young sons, but the short lifespan of ancient Egyptians meant that young rulers and the requirement for regents was not unusual, and Hatshepsut's royal credentials as both daughter and wife of past pharaohs were unimpeachable. Thutmose III was recognized as king from the beginning of his co-regent period, which ran from 1478 BC to 1473 BC. Monuments from the time show the child king in the form of an adult, as was traditional, performing royal duties and rituals. Hatshepsut, dressed in royal female garb, is depicted off to one side, demurely watching over her stepson. But Hatshepsut's rise to full power was not inevitable at the start of their joint reign. It was only several years later that Hatshepsut began appearing on monuments in the costume of the male pharaoh, indicating a change in status. The first example we have of this gender-swapping power dressing comes from the second year of the co-regent period, with Hatshepsut depicted in the Karnak temple complex in Thebes wearing the robes of a female ruler, but the crown of a male king. This slow adoption of the symbols of the pharaoh suggests that her rise to power was gradual, rather than an abrupt coup. But, in around 1473 BC, Hatshepsut took on the title of King of Upper and Lower Egypt and the regalia and other formal titles of the pharaoh of Egypt. This was a permanent promotion. Hatshepsut could not step down when Thutmose came of age as the role of pharaoh was a lifelong responsibility. Pharaohs could not abdicate or rule temporarily. But even at this time, when her power was at its height, she ruled as a co-ruler with Thutmose III. The reasons behind Hatshepsut's decision to take on the full titles of kingship are lost to history. She may have been acting to safeguard the throne for Thutmose III as the deaths of Thutmose's mother Isis and Hatshepsut's mother Ahmose removed the remaining links to the previous royal generation and perhaps left Hatshepsut feeling exposed. Although 19th and 20th century Egyptologists were keen to present Hatshepsut as an ambitious, cunning woman with an unnatural hunger for power, there is little evidence to support this view. It was more likely that Hatshepsut's instinct was to continue to rule as co-regent in the name of Thutmose III. Ruling with the full power of the pharaoh and in her own name would have been a great risk, given the existence of a legitimate heir and the limited precedence of female pharaohs. But a political crisis, perhaps a threat from an alternative branch of the royal family, forced her hand. She could not rule for Thutmose with the title of king's mother because he wasn't her son. His own mother, Isis, had been unable to take on the king's mother title because she had no royal blood. Between her own gender, Thutmose III's young age, and his limited legitimacy as the son of a secondary wife, Hatshepsut's options for establishing stable rule were very limited. In the end, she was the best place to rule as the daughter and principal wife of two pharaohs and the holder of the influential religious title of God's Wife.
The title of God's wife of Amun had given her authority even before her elevation to co-regent or co-ruler. It was this title that won her the support of the priests. The God's wife led festivals to the god Amun, one of the primordial Egyptian gods who was later merged with the ancient sun god to become Amun-Ra and assisted the high priest in his sacred duties at the great temple of Amun at Karnak. She was held in high regard because it was believed she had direct interaction with Amun, who was revered in Thebes as the creator god and later king of the gods. The god's wife had enough influence and power to dictate policy as ancient Egypt was a priest-led society where religion and government were deeply intertwined. Hatshepsut was the last god's wife for many decades, perhaps because the role bestowed enormous power, privilege and wealth on the woman who held this title. Hatshepsut's experience leading religious rituals and working closely with the priests stood her in good stead for the duties of a pharaoh. As well as leading religious processions and festivals, pharaohs had a more direct divine responsibility. Ancient Egyptians saw their pharaohs as a link between the gods and the human race. Pharaohs would be responsible for direct communication with the 42 state gods and goddesses and were charged with maintaining the cosmic order established during creation called Ma'at. In many cases, pharaohs themselves were seen as semi-divine beings, with some believed to be born of Amun-Ra, including Hapshetsut, and when they died would become fully-fledged divine beings. As well as the support of the priests, Hatshepsut would have relied on the favor of the royal family and the courtiers. Arguments that the cunning Hatshepsut sought to overthrow her stepson and rule alone are undermined by the fact that the ancient Egyptian royal family relied on the support of other elite groups. The risk of being overthrown would have reminded Hatshepsut that she was answerable to others. It seems likely that the courtiers, as well as the priests, supported Hatshepsut's rise to power. Only 70 years before her reign, Egypt had been divided during the Second Intermediate Period, with large regions ruled by other groups, including the Hyksos in the north and the Kingdom of Kush in the south. Courtiers relied on the royal family for their privileged positions, and the loss of this royal line would have threatened their power and caused widespread turmoil. Stability and prosperity were the aims of the day, and Hatshepsut, along with the shining legacy of her father, Thutmose I, seemed to offer just that. There is no surviving evidence that suggests Hatshepsut faced any major challenges to her reign. Although she technically ruled as a co-ruler with her stepson, it was clear that Hatshepsut was in charge, with her stepson happy to lead her army and not use this power against her. Despite 19th and 20th century attempts to present this co-ruling duo as in conflict, with Thutmose seen as embittered by his stepmother's rising power, there is little evidence of this. The pieces of evidence which have reached us in the present show a harmonious working relationship. While he grew up, Thutmose valued Hatshepsut's experience of ruling, including during her father's reign while he fought in campaigns. Her guidance and her illustrious status as a direct descendant of the royal bloodline. Without the public and elite support Hatshepsut had won, it is possible that the infant Thutmose would have lost the throne to another. It was perhaps the fear of her royal line losing the kingship that encouraged Hatshepsut to become pharaoh. Her claim to more power was supported and she received the official regalia of the pharaoh, including the cut headcloth featuring the uraeus, the rearing cobra, a traditional false beard, and shendit kilt. Many statues survive showing Hatshepsut in this androgynous royal attire. In reliefs, she is shown striding forward and standing tall, as well as the traditional pious kneeling position rather than the demure postures of Egyptian female figures. The feminine ankle-length dress and closed feet stance are rarely used in images of Hatshepsut. Women could have high status in ancient Egypt and had legal rights to property, unlike in many other ancient and modern civilizations. There had been examples of powerful Egyptian women, including Hatshepsut's own mother, Ahmose, who wielded great influence as the king's daughter. Throughout ancient Egyptian history, many mortal women were worshipped as goddesses, and both before and after Hatshepsut, women reigned as pharaohs.
Chentkaus I, Nitokris, and Sobek Neferu had all ruled in some capacity prior to Hatshepsut, and Nefer and Feruatin, Tuosret and Cleopatra were just some of the important female rulers who came after her. But there was no word for queen in ancient Egypt. King's wife was the title given to those who married the pharaoh. The ruler was called the king or pharaoh, no matter their gender and female pharaohs, that is, women who ruled fully under their own name and with the regalia and titles of pharaoh, were not common. Before Hatshepsut, there had only been Sobek Neferu, who had reigned six dynasties before her and had taken on the male title of king. As the office of pharaoh was a distinctly male one, adaptation was necessary for female rulers. The symbolism of ancient Egyptian kingship, the crook and flail, and the uraeus and masculine dress was designed for male rulers given that the role usually passed from father to son. In the majority of the statues and works of art that have survived until the modern day, Hatshepsut is presented as a masculine king. This was one of the reasons why it took Egyptologists so long to identify her. Hieroglyphic inscriptions said female king, but the imagery was almost entirely masculine. Presenting herself as a male king wasn't deceitful. It was tradition. Egyptian art often presented things as they should be rather than how they are. Older kings and infant kings, like Thutmose III, were also presented as having youthful, trim, masculine physiques. She presented herself as other kings did. Relief scenes show Hatshepsut completing historic kingly rituals, from making offerings to the gods and celebrating festivals to trampling foreign captives in the form of a sphinx. Hatshepsut did not completely hide her femininity as she took on the masculine attributes of the kingship. She replaced the traditional male titles and epithets used on hieroglyphic labels on statues and reliefs with feminine variations. Her name was often followed up with daughter of Re, and the feminine word endings she used led to grammatical oxymorons like his majesty herself. In private spaces, statues of Hatshepsut depicted her with a mix of male and female attributes. Two rare examples of these statues, now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, show her with the masculine headdress of the pharaoh combined with an obvious feminine silhouette or even in full feminine dress. It was in public spaces, such as on the processional way, that her statues presented her as a young king in the prime of life. When in sphinx form, kneeling or standing, Hatshepsut's statues sought to portray her as the ideal male king. She also called on the religious aspects of the pharaoh to bolster her legitimacy. She styled herself as Matkare, meaning truth is the soul of the sun god, to emphasize her connection to Amun. One myth even has her as the demigod child of Amun. She aimed to highlight her moral responsibilities as pharaoh. Ma'at, meaning the truth, order and justice bestowed by the gods, referred to her ability as the legitimate pharaoh to communicate with the gods. This title plainly said that she was destined to help maintain Ma'at and bring stability and prosperity to Egypt. Hatshepsut's legitimacy was further bolstered by the proclamation of the Oracle of Amun. The oracle declared that Hatshepsut's rise to become pharaoh was in fact Amun's will. Hatshepsut promoted the words of the oracle by carving the following proclamation on many of her grand monuments. Welcome, my sweet daughter, my favorite, the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Ma'atkare Hatshepsut. Thou art the pharaoh, taking possession of the two lands. But even the oracle's words did not make Hatshepsut lose sight of the fact that she was a co-ruler. She ordered a relief to be made to showcase her rise to power, which showed both herself and Thutmose III. This relief was placed in the Red Chapel, a sacred building in the sanctuary of Amun-Ra at the Temple of Karnak, which housed the Usurhat Amun, a golden boat used by the god Amun to travel around. Both she and her co-ruler Thutmose were presented as men, but Hatshepsut now took the place of precedence. The words of Amun, via the oracle and this visual representation of her power in a place sacred to Amun, emphasized her divine right to be pharaoh. To highlight her legitimacy, Hatshepsut also emphasized her connection to her father, Pharaoh Thutmose I. 
She appeared to idolize her father, who had won fame for his military victories and expansion. When Hatshepsut was a young child, he had returned from his victory against the Kushans in Nubia with the naked body of a Nubian chieftain displayed on the prow of his ship. Thutmose's expansion of the Egyptian empire had vastly increased its prosperity. By presenting herself as her father's chosen successor, she tied herself to his illustrious legacy and to a long line of successful pharaohs of the 18th dynasty. However, historical evidence to support Hatshepsut's claim of being her father's named successor has not been found. The claim seems especially dubious given that Hatshepsut was married to her half-brother Thutmose II to strengthen his claim as heir. Tradition dictated that sons, even those of secondary wives, took precedence over daughters. Historically, women had only come to power when no male successor was available. So, it seems unlikely that Thutmose I would have named Hatshepsut as his successor. But Hatshepsut ensured that her version of history would persevere by inscribing her claim on the walls of her mortuary temple at Deir el-Bahari. Then His Majesty said to them, This daughter of mine, Knumetamun Hatshepsut, may she live. I have appointed as my successor upon my throne. She shall direct the people in every sphere of the palace. It is she indeed who shall lead you. Obey her words. Unite yourselves at her command. The royal nobles, the dignitaries, and the leaders of the people heard this proclamation of the promotion of his daughter, the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Maat Kare. May she live eternally. Visual representations and inscriptions in buildings were important parts of Egyptian history and successful kingship. Without these architectural works, little would be known of ancient Egypt today. But more importantly, building programs gave the pharaohs the opportunity for self-aggrandizement and legend building. The achievements of the pharaohs would live on in their architectural works long after they were gone, and Hatshepsut understood this better than anyone. Hatshepsut has been remembered predominantly for her influence on the arts. Her reign saw a cultural renaissance that was to have a lingering effect on Egyptian art and architecture for a millennium. She was one of the most prolific pharaoh builders, with thousands of projects throughout Upper and Lower Egypt and especially around the city of Thebes. Many temples were built to display her piety and bolster her claim to semi-divine status as the god's wife of Amun. She also sought to promote her own accomplishments and show off the wealth her policies had brought to Egypt. It was a chance for her to write her own story and ensure that she would not be forgotten. Her buildings were of a much grander style than her predecessors and were so impressive that later rulers attempted to claim them as their own. She ordered the production of so much statuary that every major museum in the world has pieces from Hatshepsut's reign in their ancient Egypt collections, including a whole room dedicated to her pieces at the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art. The vastness of her building and statuary projects has left us important evidence about her as a ruler and about how she wanted to be perceived. The grandest of all Hatshepsut's building projects was, as was traditional, the Mortuary Temple of Hatshepsut, which still exists. Ancient Egyptian mortuary temples were not so much about death as they were a celebration of the eternal life of the pharaoh and their union with the god Amun. A mortuary temple was built for Hatshepsut in the complex at Deir al-Bahari on the west bank of the Nile River, across the bank from the ancient city of Thebes and the modern city of Luxor. It was built into the cliff face looking towards the Karnak temple complex on the opposite side of the Nile, where prestigious temples and monuments had been built. She chose a site that would add to her prestige. Her temple was built next to that of Menduhotep II, the first king of the Middle Kingdom and the man who had reunified Upper and Lower Egypt. The plot had originally been quarried for her father's tomb. Hatshepsut linked her own mortuary temple to that of her father's, showing her devotion to him and tying their legacies together to emphasize her legitimacy. She sought to present herself as the rightful successor and dutiful daughter of Thutmose I. She even created a mortuary cult for him in her temple and later moved his body there so that they would lie there together. Hatshepsut and her father Thutmose I were not the only kings to designate their final resting places in this region. Hatshepsut's mortuary temple 
was so illustrious that future pharaohs built their own mortuary temples near to hers, forming what is now known as the Valley of the Kings. Architectural innovation dominated the design of Hatshepsut's temple. It began as a small project in the shadow of Mentuhotep II's tomb. The project grew into a large terraced monument that had to be cut into the cliff face, showing impressive architectural skill. It was enormous, almost the size of two and a half football fields. It featured so many colonnades and courtyards upon its terraces that it appeared to rise up to the side of the mountain. Hatshepsut moved away from the fortress-like designs used by her predecessors and pioneered a more ornate, aesthetically pleasing look. Her beautiful architectural style inspired many future building projects and mortuary temples. Although many of the intricate elements of her original design are now missing, there is enough evidence left behind to piece together what the temple would have looked like in its heyday. The lower levels of her temple were softened with luscious gardens and reflective pools. The myrrh trees from the famous trade expedition she sent to the semi-mythical land of Punt were planted here to highlight her link with the gods and the wealth and exotic goods she had brought to Egypt. The likeness of Hatshepsut appeared in the temple's design many times over. Over a hundred statues of the female pharaoh in the form of a sphinx lined the processional way. These Hatshepsut sphinxes were placed here because the sphinx was seen as a spiritual guardian. This form also had the benefit of removing any signs of gender. The sphinx was always the head of the pharaoh and the body of a lion, sometimes with the addition of falcon's wings. More images of Hatshepsut were placed on the temple's terraces. Some of these statues were over 10 feet tall and were intended to be seen from a great distance. Several show Hatshepsut in devotional poses, such as kneeling amongst offerings to the gods or even taking on the appearance of Osiris, god of resurrection. The majority of the statues of Hatshepsut show her in a masculine light, in the appearance of the traditionally male pharaoh. Many of them have survived, some whole and some in fragments into the present. The centerpiece of the project was the Jezer Jezeru, the Holy of Holies, the center of the mortuary temple, which was accessed along a large causeway. It was a symmetrical, multi-columned structure similar in appearance to the Parthenon in Athens, which was built nearly 1,000 years later. The Jezer Jezeru sat back in the cliff face and at the top of the grand terraces. In the Jezer Jezeru were altars to Amun-Ra and to Hatshepsut, where her cult would continue to worship her even after her death. As well as their religious function, mortuary temples would glorify the pharaoh. The reliefs inside Hatshepsut's temple celebrated the achievements of her reign. The trading expedition to semi-mythical Punt on the Red Sea was represented. On the relief, sailors and traders load exotic luxury goods onto the Egyptian ships, from panther skins to frankincense, as well as the myrrh trees which were planted at the temple. The accompanying inscription reads, Never were such things brought to any king since the world was. This relief showed Hatshepsut as a successful economic and religious leader. The trading mission to Punt was just one of many trade routes developed under her reign, and the prosperity they brought to Egypt was a significant part of the Third Golden Age. It also showed Hatshepsut as a successful religious leader, as these new exotic goods were thought to be especially desirable to the gods. Another significant relief showed Hatshepsut's divine conception and birth. Hatshepsut encouraged the narrative that she was the biological daughter of the god Amun, who had appeared to her mother in the form of her husband, Thutmose I. The later trend for emphasizing a pharaoh's divine birth is believed to have begun with Hatshepsut, who needed to legitimize her claim to the throne. Hatshepsut sought to highlight the sacred link between the pharaoh and the gods, in particular, her personal link with Amun. It was the first time a pharaoh had built a mortuary temple, which was primarily a temple to the god Amun. As well as the altar to Amun, new religious rituals were established to celebrate Amun and his connection with the pharaoh. For example, during a festival of the dead, the cult statue of Amun was sailed across the river to spend a night in Hatshepsut's tomb. The religious rituals she created, usually the privilege of male kings, would have been seen as important as the buildings she commissioned, 
and were clear evidence that she was the legitimate pharaoh. The landscape of Egypt was fundamentally altered by Hatshepsut's building projects. As well as her mortuary temple in Deir el-Bahari, she added and restored many more temples and monuments across Egypt. Monuments were constructed at the Temple of Karnak, as was the tradition under most pharaohs. The Red Chapel was built here, which was a religious chapel dedicated to Amun, and featured carvings showing key moments from Hatshepsut's life. A pair of obelisks were constructed to celebrate her 16th year as pharaoh. This momentous construction was commemorated on a relief which showed the 450-ton obelisks being transported along the Nile by 27 ships. As well as telling the story of her reign, the obelisks have allowed archaeologists a glimpse at Hatshepsutian architectural design and construction. The discovery of the unfinished obelisk, a broken version left in the quarry in Aswan where it was made, shows the hard work, craftsmanship and innovation which went into creating these monuments. Hatshepsut also ordered the restoration of great monuments. The precinct of Mut, the mother goddess of Egypt, had been sacked during the Hyksos occupation and was rebuilt under Hatshepsut. The new design featured twin obelisks at the temple's entrance that, at the time, were the tallest in the world. One of them still stands today, and is the second tallest ancient obelisk still upright. The restoration of the Mut precinct was a building project so magnificent that later pharaohs pillaged it for features to bolster their own projects. Other important building projects ordered by Hatshepsut included the Temple of Pakhet at Beni Hassan, south of Alminya. The temple mixed the cultures north and south of the area by being dedicated to both Bast and Sehmet, two lioness war goddesses. Inside was a denunciation of the Hyksos by Hatshepsut. In it, she claimed that the Hyksos occupation of Egypt had created a cultural decline that was reversed by Hatshepsut herself. The huge underground temple was admired by the Greeks when they occupied Egypt during the Ptolemaic dynasty as it bore resemblance to their own hunter goddess Artemis and was renamed by them the Spios Artemidos. As with other impressive buildings, a later pharaoh, this time Seti I of the 19th dynasty, attempted to wipe Hatshepsut's name from the project and replace it with his own. Hatshepsut also devoted time and money to public works programs. These works were mainly focused on the area around Thebes, the dynastic and religious center of the Thutmose Hatshepsut era. A network of roads and sanctuaries were built, which encouraged access to religious sites and were also used for royal and theological processions. The transformation of the physical and ritual landscape of Egypt was not Hatshepsut's only accomplishment. She also brought huge wealth to Egypt by bolstering its diplomatic and trading links and by being uninterested in expensive wars. This was important as her innovations in architecture and ritual art required huge expenditure. It also pleased the elites, who desired access to exotic goods and wealth in order to display their status. Maintaining the Golden Age ensured Hatshepsut the support and loyalty she needed to rule. Hatshepsut came from a line of economically and culturally successful pharaohs. Her ancestor, Ahmose I, had reunified Egypt after the turbulent Second Intermediate Period, triggering a golden age. And her father, Thutmose I, had strengthened Egypt, leaving her a prosperous and expanding nation to rule. Spurred on by the economic growth and stability of the last few decades, the elites in Hatshepsut's court began to develop a cosmopolitan outlook an interest in the technological and luxury goods in East Africa and Arabia belonged to the 18th dynasty period as a whole, but was particularly significant under Hatshepsut. There is archaeological evidence that new goods arrived in Egypt during the early part of the 18th dynasty from new musical instruments to oil. Hatshepsut supported this more outward-facing worldview and the desire for foreign goods by building and reforming foreign ties, she sent expeditions to foreign lands to the south and the east and encouraged foreign embassies to visit with diplomatic gifts, which increased her prestige. She built new trading links to gain access to desirable goods, from frankincense, which was charred to make coal eyeliner, to oil and the latest military weapons. 
She worked to re-establish the trade networks disrupted by the Hyksos occupation of Egypt. She was particularly interested in reopening ancient trade routes as she sought to go back to the ancient traditions of kingship, ritual and trade. Foreign trade was vital to a pharaoh because luxury goods were a symbol of royal power and legitimacy, but also had an important religious aspect. Exotic goods such as frankincense, which was believed to make a place divine through its smell, and myrrh were thought to impress the gods, especially the god Amun, whose name was used to legitimize Hatshepsut's trade missions. Towards the middle of her reign, Hatshepsut sent a large trade embassy fleet to the semi-mythical land of Punt. This fleet was made up of five ships at 21 meters long each, with several sails and 210 sailors. As Punt was located somewhere on the Red Sea, perhaps in East Africa or Arabia, the fleet were required to flat-pack their ships and carry them over 100 miles from the River Nile to the Red Sea. The expedition was successful and returned with frankincense, gold, ivory, exotic animals, panther skins and, for the first time in recorded history, live trees. The expedition was commemorated in a relief at her mortuary temple and in many other tombs and temples on the west bank of the Nile. The prosperity which resulted from Hatshepsut's diplomatic and trading policies was unhindered by military expenses. Although her father had won fame through military victories and expansion, Hatshepsut pursued a peaceful foreign policy. The only possible exceptions to her peaceful reign were raiding expeditions to Byblos and the Sinai Peninsula and campaigns against Nubia and Canaan. An early successful and short campaign in Nubia is shown on a relief at Hatshepsut's temple, though this militaristic relief does not take pride of place. Hatshepsut's foreign policy was directed at diplomacy and trade. An important element in Hatshepsut's success was her astute selection of loyal officials. These hand-picked officials controlled the key government posts that were essential for effective rule, from diplomacy to monument building. The most notable of these officials was Senenmut, who, among many other titles, was the overseer of all royal works. Senenmut came from a non-royal, non-elite family, and perhaps had a military background. He rose quickly within royal circles after becoming the tutor of Hatshepsut's daughter Neferure. The number of his titles and responsibilities increased dramatically. According to some Egyptologists, he had as many as 93 titles including the prestigious Great Steward of Amun. His responsibilities in this important role included taking care of the estates of the god Amun, which would have brought him huge material wealth. As the overseer of all royal works, he also played a leading role in Hatshepsut's building projects, including possibly designing her mortuary temple. The trust Hatshepsut had in him is evident in the responsibilities she gave him regarding her daughter her most prized god, and the temple in which she would be laid to rest. Senenmut took advantage of his new wealth and prestige by building himself two tombs and at least 26 statues more than any other non-royal. The masses of images and text about Senenmut represented a huge diversion in the way non-royals were presented. He even had images of himself praying placed in Hatshepsut's temple though they were hidden discreetly behind doors, which would have been left open when the public could enter the temple. For ancient Egyptians, this merging of royal and non-royal effigies in a sacred temple would have been unusual and even distasteful. As Senenmut never married and Hatshepsut didn't remarry after her husband's death, it has been suggested that they were lovers. Three somewhat unconvincing pieces of evidence have been used to support this claim. Firstly, the titles and honors Hatshepsut bestowed on him, despite his non-elite status. Secondly, the fact that Senenmut's name features in Hatshepsut's mortuary temple more than her husband's name. And thirdly, a statue, now in the Neues Museum in Berlin, showing Senenmut hugging a female child believed to be Hatshepsut's daughter Neferure. This third piece of evidence certainly highlights an unusual bond between Senenmut his royal tutee, Neferure, and Hatshepsut, because non-aristocrats were not allowed to touch royalty. However, there is no strong evidence to support the argument that Hatshepsut and Senenmut had a physical relationship. 
While an example of temple graffiti showing a sexual relationship between a man and a woman, who may or may not be wearing the headdress of the pharaoh, has been suggested as being Hatshepsut and Senenmut, there is no evidence to support this identification. It is clear that Hatshepsut trusted and relied upon her advisor Senenmut, and that he had successfully made a space for himself in the close-knit royal family circle, but there is no legitimate evidence that they were lovers. After a long reign which spanned two decades, Hatshepsut died in the 22nd year of her rule. Although the precise date of her death is unclear, her successor, Thutmose III, recorded the start of his reign on the 16th of January 1458 BC. In that year, he took on the title Ruler of Ma'at, for the first time, signaling that Hatshepsut had died. She is thought to have died in her late forties and had lived what was considered a relatively long life in ancient times. No record of the cause of death has survived. It is believed that Hatshepsut was initially interned with her father, Thutmose I, as she had wished. However, Thutmose I's body was later moved elsewhere by Thutmose III. Hatshepsut's mummy was perhaps also moved at this time, with her new location most commonly believed to be in the tomb of her nurse, Sitra In. This change was perhaps ordered by Amenhotep II, son of Thutmose III, by a secondary wife, as he sought to secure his own uncertain legitimacy to rule. Given this confusion, Hatshepsut's mummy has been difficult for Egyptologists to find. Her mortuary temple, recorded as Tomb KV-20, did not contain any likely candidates. But in 1902, archaeologist Howard Carter, who found the tomb of Tutankhamun, discovered a second possible location for Hatshepsut's final resting place, Tomb KV-60, which had been the burial place of her nurse Sitra In. This second site seems to fit in with the story of her body being moved to a more discreet location by her successors. Inside this tomb, two female mummies were found, and one was positively identified as Hatshepsut's nurse. The other was not identified. It was not until 2007 that archaeologist Zahi Hawass released a statement to the scientific community claiming that this second female mummy was indeed Hatshepsut. The process of identification was unconventional, as the DNA had not survived well enough for testing. Instead, a missing tooth in a box with Hatshepsut's name on it was reunited with this mummy, and it seemed to be a perfect fit. If this was Hatshepsut's mummy, it can shed some light on her mysterious death. This mummy showed signs of bone cancer, perhaps caused by a benzopyrene carcinogenic skin lotion found with the body. Her family was said to suffer from a genetic inflammatory skin disease, so perhaps the lotion had been used to soothe this condition. However, the tooth may have belonged to a later royal lady of the same name from the 21st dynasty. Equally, the hand position of the mummy was that of a king's wife, not a pharaoh, which suggests it wasn't her. In 2011, the identification of the missing tooth was proven to be false. The tooth was a lower molar, while the mummy from KV-60 was missing an upper molar. Doubt was cast on Hawass's theory, but calls for the DNA testing of the tooth were halted by Hawass and the Cairo Museum, who wanted to protect it against the destruction caused by the testing process. To further complicate matters, Hatshepsut's funerary furniture has been found at several different sites across the Valley of the Kings. These items included a wide range of goods, from a throne-like bedstead to red jasper game pieces, all displaying her favoured lioness symbol and a partial shabti, or funerary figurine. The true location of Hatshepsut's mummy, if Hawass's mummy is to be discounted, may simply never be found. Hatshepsut's resting place has been hard to find because, after two decades as pharaoh, she disappeared from history. She is missing from the roll list of kings and the scribes never mentioned her. Her many monuments and temples were ascribed to later pharaohs, and she appears in vague references to a female ruler around that time, sometimes as an Amesis or an Amenenthe. But her name had vanished. Hatshepsut was returned to history in 1822 AD, when her name was found on a statue of what appeared to be a male ruler 
by Jean-François Champollion, decipherer of the Rosetta Stone. The hieroglyphic inscription on this masculine statue stated that it actually depicted a female ruler. The statue had been found in the inner chambers of Hatshepsut's temple at Deir el-Bahari. Everything in the public-facing areas had been completely erased. Even when Hatshepsut did appear in the historical narrative around the 19th century, Egyptologists often described her as a usurper. She was seen as a manipulative woman, with an unnatural lust for power at the expense of her young stepson. She was interpreted as a vain, ambitious and unscrupulous woman by Metropolitan Museum curator William Hayes in 1953, who excavated her funerary temple in the 1920s alongside curator Herbert Winlock. The scholarly consensus in the 19th and 20th centuries was that Hatshepsut had seized power rather than inherited it. Discoveries of pits full of broken Hatshepsut statues in the 1920s and 1930s only encouraged the view that Hatshepsut had stolen the throne from Thutmose III, who later avenged himself upon her legacy. The attack on Hatshepsut's image seems brutal enough to be personal. The heads of her statue had been severed and the cobra symbol of royalty hacked from her forehead. The pharaohs were regarded as godlike, often as the physical representation of the gods. So this defilement was blasphemous. Other powerful women had been spared this treatment, but Hatshepsut had ruled not as a king's mother, as several other ancient Egyptian women had, but as a female king. These king's mothers were honored for generations, often more so than the principal wife, showing that a woman holding power was not inappropriate to the ancient Egyptian mind. But female regnants and female pharaohs were hounded out of history, perhaps because they were succeeded not by their sons, but by others with weaker ties to the royal line and limited legitimacy. Destroying the public memory of these female rulers would strengthen the position of these later kings. The attempted erasure of Hatshepsut from history was carried out possibly towards the end of Thutmose III's reign and more certainly during the reign of his son, Amenhotep II. The erasure was carried out in a haphazard way. Crude cover-ups and additions aimed to hide her name and image by replacing her with Thutmose I or Thutmose II. Her image was chiseled off stone walls, her name was removed from monuments and gaps left in works of art. Her statues were pulled down and smashed. In 1927, when curator Herbert Winlock discovered a pit full of smashed Hatshepsut statues, he assumed this proved she had usurped the throne and later been struck from history for this reason. The real reason why this incomplete rewriting of history occurred is unknown. Answers posed by archaeologists have included self-promotion and cost-saving. There was a tradition of rulers reusing the grand burial monuments and a statuary of older pharaohs for themselves. It has been argued that Amenhotep II, as co-ruler toward the end of his father's reign, had ordered the defacing of Hatshepsut's monuments. His legitimacy was perhaps questioned by Hatshepsut's legacy as he was not related to her and she held the purer line of descent from the great old pharaohs. He also broke from royal tradition by not recording the names of his wives and ending the powerful roles and titles of royal women, including that of God's wife. Older explanations that Thutmose III had co-reigned with Hatshepsut unwillingly and had attempted to erase her from history out of bitterness have since been overturned. Thutmose had the power, as leader of her army, to overthrow Hatshepsut, if he had so wanted. Even after her death, her images remained in view on public buildings for 20 years during his reign. The haphazard nature of the erasures also challenges the view that Thutmose was taking long-awaited revenge against Hatshepsut. The masses of images of her would not have survived to the present if the motive had been hatred and jealousy. Only the most visible, most accessible images of Hatshepsut were removed. Access to her image was maintained beyond the reach of the public eye. It has been suggested that her image and name survived out of the public eye because whoever had orchestrated her erasure had wanted to avoid sacrilege. Mortuary temples were built to honor the gods, but also to provide a home for the cult of that particular pharaoh. 
the cult of the pharaoh would continue to worship the pharaoh after they had died, performing rituals which renewed the pharaoh's divinity. It was believed that after their death, pharaohs became fully divine and assimilated with Osiris, god of reincarnation, and Ra, god of the sun. Given this view of Egyptian kingship, whoever erased Hatshepsut may have deliberately avoided tarnishing her divinity. Another theory was that Thutmose aimed to relegate Hatshepsut to the position of regent, the traditional role of powerful women, in order to safeguard future royal succession patterns. The achievements of Hatshepsut's reign was evidence that the traditional male role of pharaoh could be successfully held by a woman. Hatshepsut proved, more so than other ancient Egyptian female rulers, that a woman could rule during a long, prosperous and expansive period. It would also have simplified that Moses III's own claim to the throne by implying that he inherited it directly from Thutmose II, the named heir of Thutmose I. This would explain why only public celebrations of Hatshepsut and her accomplishments were erased, and why her name was removed from king lists. If the reinterpretation was an attempt to smooth the path for his son's succession, this would explain why the attack on Hatshepsut only began towards the end of Thutmose III's reign. Whatever the motive, the brutal but haphazard erasure of Hatshepsut resulted in an incomplete picture of her when she was rescued from history. The destruction of her image and monuments has been dimly interpreted as evidence that she was a power-hungry woman who deserved to be erased. But as cultural attitudes towards women in power have changed, so too her views on Hatshepsut. Instead of asking how she had tricked her way to power and manipulated her stepson, Historians today debate the circumstances which allowed Hatshepsut to come to power, her relationship with her co-ruler Thutmose III, and why he might have tried to destroy her memory 20 years after her death. She broke tradition by ruling as regent for a son who was not her own. She was only the second woman to become pharaoh and rule under her own name. She bolstered female kingship and built extensive temples to publicly celebrate her reign. Many women went on to hold positions of power, including becoming pharaoh after her, but she was perhaps given this power by men, seeking to further their own wealth and influence. Her heritage and her record as the god's wife, and as a placeholder ruler while her father was on military campaigns, had perhaps convinced elites that she was uniquely placed to rule Egypt at a time of prosperity. She was, as historian Kara Kuni states, the only woman to have ever taken power as a king in ancient Egypt during a time of prosperity and expansion. And then she was erased from history. There is evidence to suggest that Hatshepsut herself was conscious that her legacy might be deliberately buried. On a second pair of obelisks at Karnak, she had the following inscription inscribed. Now my heart turns this way and that as I think what the people will say. Those who shall see my monuments in years to come and who shall speak of what I have done. Although she temporarily disappeared from history and was not the most famous female pharaoh, a distinction reserved for Cleopatra, Hatshepsut arguably left the greatest cultural legacy of any pharaoh. Her monuments and temples inspired thousands of architectural works even after she was gone. Some of the greatest architectural wonders of the ancient world, including her mortuary temple, were built during her reign. Masses of exotic goods, artifacts, artworks and monuments found from Hatshepsut's reign show that she laid the foundations of the golden age of the new kingdom. Ancient Egypt undoubtedly flourished under her rule. What do you think of Hatshepsut? Was she an effective and legitimate ruler? Or was she a scheming stepmother, removed from history because she had stolen the throne? Please let us know in the comment section, and in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. The man known to history as Ramesses the Great, known simply as Ramesses in his lifetime, was born in the late 14th century BC. Scholars tend to hold that he was most likely born in the year 1303 BC, 
but there is no extant information as to his exact date of birth. His father was a member of a leading aristocratic and military family, which hailed from the northern part of Egypt, probably from one of the several fortified urban centers of the Nile River Delta. His original name is unclear, but he would later become known as Seti I, as we will see. Ramesses' mother was Tuya, the daughter of a military officer named Raya, and so a member of the Egyptian military nobility herself. Ramesses was born into a world that had been going through one of the first golden ages of ancient times. This was the height of the Bronze Age, and powerful centralized states had emerged in many parts of the eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East. The Greek world was dominated by powers like the Mycenae on the mainland and the Minoans on the island of Crete, and throughout this time, complex literary and artistic societies were beginning to emerge in ways which would shape the ancient world for centuries to come. In what is now Turkey, the powerful Hittite Empire had emerged, centered on the city of Hattusa. Shortly before Ramesses' birth, it had begun conquering parts of the Levant and Mesopotamia, and was effectively Egypt's most significant rival for power in the region. Further to the southeast, a number of significant states existed in Mesopotamia proper and Persia, notably the Babylonian Empire and the Assyrian Empire. Each of these polities was wealthy, had complex bureaucracies, and was engaged in extensive trade across this Bronze Age world. For instance, a trader or merchant in a city like Tyre or Sidon in the Levant in the 14th century BC could purchase pottery from Knossos in Crete, olive oil from Athens in Greece, papyrus from Egypt, and textiles from Mesopotamia and Persia, all bought and sold in copper, gold and silver, mined in places like western Anatolia under the Hittites' control, or Cyprus, a major center of copper mining, a necessity in order to make bronze chariots, weapons and other utensils. Egypt itself was no exception to this story of prosperity. This was an era known as the New Kingdom period, one which had begun in the 16th century BC, and which would extend beyond Ramesses' own time. The term New Kingdom is a relatively modern construct, having been coined in the 19th century, but it is typically accepted by Egyptologists as accurately describing a distinct period of Bronze Age culture in Egypt, which was more prosperous than anything which had preceded it there, even the Old Kingdom culture of the pharaohs who built the Great Pyramids at Giza a millennium earlier. During this New Kingdom period, the pharaohs developed a powerful government overseen by viziers and many scribes. A large military was also kept at the ready, powered by new technologies such as chariots and weapons made of bronze. With all this in train, the pharaohs were not only able to collect a greater amount of taxes and govern more efficiently at home, but the New Kingdom Empire expanded in all directions, with outposts being established further down the River Nile than ever before into what is now Sudan, but which was then known as Nubia, and a growing amount of territory being acquired on the Sinai Peninsula and northwards into Canaan and Lebanon. This empire had reached a particular peak in the 15th century BC, during the long reign of Pharaoh Thutmose III, whose conquests extended the Egyptian kingdom northeast into parts of modern-day Syria and northern Iraq. Little is known about the specifics of Ramesses' own childhood, but the political developments of the time were extremely significant. At the time he was born, Egypt was ruled by Pharaoh Horemheb, a member of the 18th dynasty of Egyptian pharaohs, Horomheb is known for having restored a certain amount of stability to Egypt's domestic politics after a tumultuous period during which a near predecessor, Akhenaten, had attempted to establish a monotheistic cult of the sun, replacing the traditional religious and political structures of Egypt. This caused enormous unrest within Egypt and led to its decline as an international power. Horomheb reversed many of these decisions and quelled the unrest Akhenaten had created along the course of the River Nile, but he appears to have had no surviving sons and no biological successor. As such, he decided to designate the head of his government, the Grand Vizier Paramese, as his successor. Paramese was Ramesses' grandfather, 
and so the family ascended to become the 19th dynasty of Egyptian pharaohs when Paramesa became the pharaoh, adopting the regnal name Ramesses I around 1292 BC. He ruled for just a few short years before his death, at which time Ramesses' father succeeded him as second pharaoh of the 19th dynasty, adopting the name Seti I in honor of Seth, the Egyptian god of war. Ramesses was now the heir to the throne of New Kingdom Egypt, as he was soon appointed as Prince Regent by his father, who would reign for just over a decade, during which time he began to re-establish Egyptian control over some of the territory which had been held to the northeast in Canaan and Syria, under earlier rulers such as Thutmose III, but which had been lost as a result of the divided state of the kingdom during Akhenaten's reign and religious reforms. Ramesses doubtless accompanied his father in some of his campaigns northeast of the Levant and gained valuable military experience during his time as Prince Regent. He would soon need this experience, as he ascended to the throne as a relatively young man. He is known to have become pharaoh on the 27th day of the season of the harvest in a particular year of his father's reign one which is believed to equate to an accession date of the 31st of May 1279 BC. He would reign for the next 66 years in what is typically accounted as the most significant reign of any Egyptian pharaoh, adopting the full regnal name Uzuma Atre Setepenre, meaning roughly the law or harmony of Ra. The Egyptian sun god is powerful. I am chosen of Ra. Ramesses' first major act as the new ruler of Egypt was to deal with a threat which had been growing in the northern parts of the kingdom for several years. Even before his accession, sea pirates known as the Sherden Sea Pirates had been raiding the northern coast of the kingdom into the River Nile Delta from the eastern Mediterranean. This was one of the most prosperous and important parts of Ramesses' kingdom, and it was vital that these encroachments be stopped. Thus. Beginning in the second year of his reign, he began establishing forts along the northern coast of the kingdom and northeastwards towards Sinai and Canaan. New ships were also constructed to patrol the waters of the eastern Mediterranean, and warning posts were set up to signal to larger settlements when raiding parties were making their way towards the Egyptian kingdom. All of this culminated in a major sea battle, in which Ramesses and his navy were victorious. A stele or memorial stone commemorating this at Tanis in the northeast of the Nile Delta has survived down to modern times and provides evidence of this victory today, but the exact details of how it occurred or what it involved, other than that Ramesses scored an early victory, remain unclear. Having stabilized the northern shores of Egypt and the Nile Delta, Ramesses' primary aim became to restore Egyptian control over Canaan and other parts of the Levant, as had existed in earlier times. This was a paramount concern. While Egypt itself was an affluent land based on the bounteous agriculture, practice along the shores of the River Nile, and the production of pottery and papyrus in cities like Thebes and Memphis, the most affluent cities in the Late Bronze Age world lay in Canaan, cities like Tyre and Sidon which were at the crossroads of all the major empires and were major trading centers as a result. Consequently, Ramesses was anxious to restore Egyptian rule over the region, as had existed two centuries earlier, in the time of Thutmose III. However, while there was no state with an army sufficient to withstand Egypt within Canaan and the southern reaches of the Levant, the region was also coveted by the Hittite Empire to the north. Much of Ramesses' rule would be concerned with trying to seize control of this region and stave off counterattacks by the Hittites. In the course of doing so, he would fight arguably the most significant battle in the history of the Bronze Age. One of Ramesses' first actions early in his reign was to construct a new capital in the northeastern parts of the Nile Delta, in an effort to increase Egyptian power to the northeast into the Levant. The capital of Pharaonic Egypt had moved around over the centuries. For instance, in ancient times, during the Old Kingdom period, it lay at Memphis, near what is now Cairo. However, 
The capital during the New Kingdom period was typically located well down the River Nile, at what was known then as Thebes, but which we call Luxor today. Akhenaten, the controversial pharaoh who, a half-century before Ramesses' birth, had attempted to establish a monotheistic religion centered on the worship of Aten, had established a new capital at Amarna as a center of the new religion. Thus, there was a substantial precedent for moving the capital of the Pharaonic kingdom. Ramesses named his new capital Piramses, near what is now the town of Quantir. Ramesses' father, Seti I, had previously had a summer palace in the region, and it seems likely that Ramesses had spent much of his youth here. Now, in the 1270s, he established it as a quasi-military capital with large workshops and factories erected to begin churning out significant quantities of weapons, armor, and chariots. As such, Piramses became a kind of administrative capital of Lower Egypt, but as we will see from Ramesses' building program, he never abandoned the belief that Thebes or Luxor was the religious and spiritual capital of Egypt. In the earliest part of his wars against the Hittites, Ramesses faced King Muatali II, the ruler of the Hittite Empire, since the mid-1290s. This Muatali had taken advantage of Egyptian weakness early in his reign and moved his capital south from the traditional site at Hattusa, in what is now central Turkey, to Tarhuntusa, in the southeast of the Konya Plain. It was indicative of how both rulers saw Canaan, Syria, and the wider Levant as a contested region, which they needed to be near, that both Ramesses and Muatali moved their capitals to be closer to the Levant. In the earliest years of his reign, Ramesses conducted annual military campaigns northeast from the Nile Delta. The first of these, around 1275 BC, resulted in the pharaoh cementing his control over southern Canaan before campaigning further north to the region around modern-day Beirut. Here he had a commemorative stele, or pylon, erected at Nar el Kalb. The text of this has been obliterated over time, but it almost certainly proclaimed Ramesses' successes in campaigning this far north, a statement of Egypt's claims to control the region. Similarly, he engaged in further campaigns against the Amuru, a people who occupied much of what is now Syria as vassals of King Muatali and the Hittites. However, whatever nominal control over this region Ramesses was able to establish in 1275 was ephemeral. No sooner had he withdrawn back to Pyramesses at the end of the campaigning season than Egyptian influence in Syria effectively collapsed and the Hittites were able to reimpose themselves. The war between the Egyptians and the Hittites at this time has become widely renowned for a battle which it is generally accepted occurred in the year 1274 BC. This was the Battle of Kadesh, or Kadesh, near the city of Kadesh on the banks of the Orontes River in western Syria. The Battle of Kadesh was clearly a highly significant one, involving armies of a very substantial size by the standards of the Late Bronze Age, but also being regarded as a unique or significant event by the parties involved. It is, for instance, the best documented military encounter of the second millennium BC, with both sides making extensive records concerning it in years to come in the form of tablets, wall paintings, and inscriptions throughout Egypt and other parts of the late Bronze Age world. Thus, the Battle of Kadesh was unquestionably believed by contemporaries to have been an era-defining military engagement. The background of the battle was Ramesses' new campaign into Syria in 1274 BC. As with the previous year's campaign, his goal was to extend Egyptian power further north into Syria at the expense of the Hittites. Ramesses led four divisions of troops into Canaan and then north towards Syria that year. These were named for some of the paramount Egyptian deities, Amun, Ra, Seth, and Ptah, and consisted of perhaps as many as 40,000 men, with 2,000 chariots also provided for the campaign. These were augmented by thousands of Canaanite mercenaries, who joined the pharaoh's forces. However, not all of these forces were deployed at Kadesh, and it seems probable that Ramesses' forces did not exceed 30,000 men in total on the field of battle. 
A raid against him was Muatali's army of somewhere between 25,000 and 45,000 men, with several thousand chariots also brought south into Syria. Consequently, the armies of the two sides were relatively evenly matched. A striking aspect of the engagement was the number of chariots deployed, with many Egyptologists and Hittite scholars speculating since that this was the largest chariot battle in history. In its initial stages, Ramesses was caught off guard at Kadesh. He received false intelligence about the location of the main Hittite army far to the north, whereas in fact Muatali's armies were stationed near Old Kadesh, not far from the Egyptian advance party. As a result, when the Hittites attacked, some of Ramesses' main divisions of troops were far to the south and could not be brought into the field of battle. As a result, the Ra division was scattered by a Hittite chariot assault in the first stages of the battle near Kadesh. However, this is the point at which Ramesses' leadership is believed to have proved pivotal, as he steeled the Ammon division of his troops and counterattacked against the Hittites, breaking their chariot assault. Some accounts have it that the fault also lay with the Hittites, who, believing that their initial attack had proved conclusive, had stopped to plunder the baggage trains and goods of the Ra division, leaving them exposed to Ramesses' coordinated counterattack. Thereafter, Muatali ordered his troops to retreat towards the Orontes River. Later Egyptian accounts suggest that the Ptah division now arrived to Kadesh and harried the Hittites. Muatali ordered a new counterattack led by his chariot divisions, but this was unable to break the Egyptian advance. Eventually, the Hittites were forced to flee northwards over the river Orontes, in many cases throwing their weapons and armor aside in order to swim through the river to safety. It is unclear exactly how conclusive the alleged Egyptian victory at Kadesh was. Some Egyptologists believe that the battle was a major military victory for Ramesses, he certainly depicted it as such. For the rest of his long reign, the pharaoh consistently erected stelae and had inscriptions and wall paintings placed in temples and in his palaces, depicting Kadesh as a great victory for Egypt in Syria. These include the Kadesh inscriptions or bulletin and the poem of Pentor, a prose account of the Egyptian victory which is repeated on the walls of temples all along the course of the River Nile. The poem is extant in eight different places, while the bulletin is to be found inscribed in seven different locations around Egypt. Consequently, it is clearly something which Ramesses tried to establish as the official version of his alleged victory at Kadesh. But other scholars of the late Bronze Age world are more skeptical, with some arguing that Kadesh was probably more of a stalemate than a victory for either side. Certainly, it cannot have been the kind of comprehensive victory which Ramesses attempted to depict it as, for the battle did not lead to any major shift in the strategic situation in Syria. Rather, the Egyptians and the Hittites continued to contest the region for many years to come. The Battle of Kadesh did not bring the war between Egypt and the Hittite Empire to a complete conclusion though it did signal the end of the most intense initial period of clashes between the Egyptians and the Hittites. Skirmishes continued for years thereafter. For instance, in 1269 BC, Ramesses launched a new campaign into Syria, during which he conquered the city of Dapur. However, the pattern during the 1260s was that Ramesses was able to briefly acquire control over parts of Syria while he campaigned personally there but longer-term control over the region could not be maintained once the major Egyptian military presence was withdrawn. In recognition of this situation around 1259 BC, the Egyptians and the Hittites agreed to what is variously called either the Egyptian-Hittite Treaty or the Eternal Treaty or Silver Treaty. This was signed between Ramesses II and Hutusili III, who had succeeded as ruler of the Hittite Empire at some point in the 1260s. The Eternal Treaty effectively brokered a lasting peace, one in which the two powers agreed to cease hostilities as it was costing both governments exorbitant amounts of money and achieving little for either. Thus, Syria was to become a sphere of Hittite influence, with Egypt largely confirmed in its control of Canaan 
and other more southerly parts of the Levant. Bonds were agreed and pledges made, and the gods invoked as overseers of the eternal peace. The Eternal Treaty is one of the most famed international agreements made in ancient times. This is owing to the highly unusual survival of multiple copies of the text over three millennia later in different languages. Copies of the text of the treaty in Egyptian hieroglyphics were found inscribed in two separate locations in Luxor in central Egypt in the first half of the 19th century. Then, in the first years of the 20th century, the German archaeologist Hugo Winkler uncovered a copy of the text in the Arcadian language, the lingua franca of the Hittite Empire and other states of the Middle East in the 13th century BC, as part of a cache of approximately 10,000 tablets which were discovered while excavating the ancient Hittite capital at Hattusa in Turkey. Thus, we have a remarkable example here of an international treaty being copied out and deposited in royal archives and temples in cities 2,000 kilometers away from each other over 3,200 years ago. As to the motives of the respective parties, it is clear that both Ramesses and Hutusili had both come to believe that peace and the fostering of trade in the Levant would be more beneficial than a continuation of their rivalry, while both states were quite likely wary of the rise of the Assyrian Empire to the east in Mesopotamia and believed the united front against this upstart power was better than ongoing warfare in Syria. The signing of the Eternal Treaty also provided a respite for Ramesses in order for him to concentrate militarily on matters to the south of Egypt. For roughly a millennium between the middle of the 3rd millennium BC down to roughly 1500 BC, the region of modern-day Sudan had been independent of Egypt. At the time, it was known as Nubia and was dominated by the Kerama culture, which produced states like the Kingdom of Kush. However, during the New Kingdom period, and in particular during the reign of Thutmose III, Nubia had gradually been brought more and more under the control of Pharaonic Egypt. As with Canaan and Syria, Egyptian control declined here as a result of the unrest created by Akhenaten's rule in the 14th century BC. But Ramesses was now in a position to reverse this situation. Early in his reign, he had already campaigned south of the first cataract of the Nile. These cataracts are a series of locations along the course of the River Nile where the whitewater rapids predominate and were used at the time as intermediary points where Egyptian arms were extended as far as was possible in campaigns against the Nubians. By the 1260s, Ramesses had effectively extended Egyptian control as far as the Second Cataract, which lies south of Abu Simbel and Wadi Halfa in what is now northern Sudan. But the period following the establishment of the Eternal Treaty with the Hittites provided a military respite which allowed Ramesses to send forces further south again to the Third Cataract. This lies well into Sudan at the northern margin of the Dongola River. Here, Ramesses was able to establish a southern military colony at Tombos, as evidenced by the discovery of pharaonic and royal inscriptions here in tombs built at the height of the New Kingdom in the 13th century BC. Thus, by the 1240s BC, Ramesses had effectively brought a significant amount of Nubia under outright Egyptian control. Ramesses was soon campaigning westwards as well. Our knowledge of Libya in ancient times is surprisingly limited for a region which was in close proximity to major centers of civilization such as Egypt and Crete. Generally speaking, the main settlement points here were a series of ports and oases along the north coast or slightly inland, but proximate to the Mediterranean Sea. The land here was known as Jehenu to the Egyptians. Libya is a name derived from later Greek descriptions of the region. Despite the lack of historical knowledge about the society that existed here in ancient times, there was significant contact between the Egyptians and Libya throughout the New Kingdom period, mostly in the form of Berber raids into the western branches of the Nile Delta and Egyptian efforts to establish coastal colonies along the north of Libya. Ramesses attempted to further this effort by establishing new forts along the Mediterranean coastline and reinforcing a fort at Zawiyat Um El Rakham, 
which his father, Seti I, had established earlier after campaigning against the Libyan tribes of the region. In the course of Ramesses' reign, this became the major western extremity of the Egyptian kingdom, though trade centers and vassal states were to be found further to the west in Libya proper. These accomplishments, as with nearly everything else to do with Ramesses' military endeavors, were recorded in a series of stelae and other monumental inscriptions in southern and central Egypt later in his reign. With these campaigns in Nubia and Libya, and the earlier endeavors in Canaan and Syria, by the middle of his reign Ramesses had succeeded in extending the Egyptian kingdom to the greatest point it had been at since the days of Thutmose III two centuries earlier. Beyond the pharaoh's core control of Egypt, his forces had moved south along the River Nile, effectively repossessing Nubia after it had broadly regained its independence during the period of instability under Akhenaten in the 14th century BC. Elsewhere, Ramesses had campaigned westwards into the deserts of the Sahara and along the north coast to bring Libya into a partial vassalage. However, it was his conquests to the northeast that were most substantial. Here, Ramesses had captured Canaan and much of Syria. It wasn't simply that this was one of the richest parts of the world at the time, with affluent trading cities like Tyre and Sidon, but in order to achieve some hegemony here, Ramesses had to defeat one of the most substantial powers of the ancient world, the Hittite Empire. In doing so, he carved out one of the largest territorial empires ever seen up to that time. Thus, in the Late Bronze Age, Ramesses had arguably transformed New Kingdom Egypt into the most powerful state in the known world, a major achievement after the period of instability that had characterized Egypt as recently as the 14th century. Throughout his military campaigns of the 1270s, 1260s and 1250s, Ramesses was accompanied by an ever-growing number of his sons. This is unsurprising when we consider that Ramesses is believed to have had approximately 100 children, of which a roughly equal amount were sons and daughters. Such a large brood was a byproduct of the practice of polygamy by ancient Egyptian pharaohs. Ramesses had many wives, the details of several of which are well known. For instance, his primary consort was Nefertari, the first of Ramesses' great royal wives. Her background is not precisely known, but some have speculated that she was descended from Pharaoh Ai, who had ruled Egypt four decades prior to Ramesses' accession as part of the 18th dynasty. She and Ramesses evidently married quite young, as she became queen consort as soon as he ascended to the throne around 1279 BC. They had many children together, and on the strength of the numerous temples and shrines which Ramesses had built in her honor, there is no doubting that she was the most revered of his wives. She is also somewhat unique as a queen consort of the New Kingdom period, for whom we have extant correspondence. Nefertari wrote on multiple occasions to King Hutusili III, ruler of the Hittite Empire, and his wife Puduhepa in the 1260s and 1250s, and tablets of this correspondence have been unearthed in the Hittite capital Hattusa. Nefertari died around 1255, and since Ramesses lived for many decades to come, new great wives emerged in the years that followed. Paramount amongst these was Isetnafret. She too seems to have married Ramesses before his accession as pharaoh, but she was clearly a junior consort while Nefertari lived. Her seniority from the mid-1250s is attested to by numerous inscriptions and records of her which appear on statues and temple walls across Egypt. Other great wives of the pharaoh emerged from political arrangements. For instance, as part of the Eternal Treaty of 1259 BC with the Hittites, Ramesses took one of the daughters of King Hattusuli III and Queen Paduhepa as his wife although the marriage to Matona Furere was not solemnized until the mid-1240s BC, presumably as the Hittite king's daughter was considered to be too young for the marriage to be formalized in the early 1250s BC. Curiously enough, some of Ramesses' other great royal wives included some of his daughters. Bint Anat, for instance, was born from Ramesses' marriage to Isetnofret, before later marrying her own father, 
Such familial relationships were common throughout the history of pharaonic Egypt and resulted in significant complications of inbreeding, the most famous example of which had been Tutankhamun 50 years before Ramesses' reign. Tutankhamun suffered from multiple physical ailments, the exact nature of which are still debated, but which Egyptologists concur were most likely owing to the species of inbreeding that characterized Ramesses II's own familial life in the 13th century BC. This extensive royal family was intimately connected throughout Ramesses' long reign with the cult of Ra, the sun god, and one of the paramount deities in the Egyptian religious system who was also worshipped as Amun-Ra in a slightly different form. Ra, along with others such as Ptah and Horus, were the paramount deities of the New Kingdom, and as we will see shortly, Ramesses' extensive building program across Egypt from the 1260s onwards made continuous efforts to associate the pharaoh with the cult of these particular deities. From the early 1240s BC onwards, once Ramesses had reigned over 30 years, he was also able to become the center of his own species of religious cult in the shape of the Sed festival or Feast of the Tail. This was a religious festival which was held annually to celebrate the reign of any pharaoh who had ruled for over 30 years. It was nominally held in honor of the wolf god, Sed or Webwawet. The origins of the festival are somewhat macabre. It may have been the case that the said festival was originally held as a ritual in which a long-lived pharaoh was ritually murdered, the idea being that once he reached a certain age, it was time for him to be removed from power. Over time, the festival changed to one in which the king was honored rather than killed. Under Ramesses, the said festival was celebrated at the traditional capital, Thebes, for the first time in 1249 BC. Thereafter, it was held every three years for as long as Ramesses lived. Such was the length of his reign that he went on to celebrate an unprecedented number of said festivals. If the first half of Ramesses' reign was primarily dominated by warfare and the extension of the realm's borders, the second half of it was remarkable for the extensive building projects which were undertaken by the pharaoh. Ancient Egypt is synonymous with brilliant architectural achievement, but this was achieved at irregular intervals. For instance, the first intermediate period of Egyptian history, which occurred in the late 3rd millennium BC, prior to the advent of the subsequent Middle Kingdom, was a period of lacklustre building projects. Conversely, the New Kingdom period, which had begun in the 16th century BC, saw a new age of major building projects commissioned by the pharaohs along the River Nile. Ramesses II was the greatest proponent of this new age of pharaonic patronage of religious and mortuary architecture. In fact, his reign witnessed the most significant building program seen since the days of pharaohs such as Cheops, who in the 26th century BC constructed the pyramid complex at Giza near modern-day Cairo including the Great Pyramids, the only surviving wonder of the ancient world. However, by the New Kingdom period, such monumental buildings as were constructed by Ramesses focused more on erecting great temples, obelisks and statues to honor the pharaoh and the gods, rather than on giant pyramids to act as mortuary tombs. One of the most significant building projects undertaken by Ramesses was at Thebes or Luxor in central Egypt the traditional capital of New Kingdom Egypt. Here Ramesses had the Ramesseum built on the Theban necropolis, an elevated region on the west bank of the River Nile in the city where many other pharaohs had erected mortuary and religious buildings over the centuries. The Ramesseum took roughly 20 years to complete and is effectively a temple with several courtyards surrounding it. Large stone pylons and gateways lead from courtyard to courtyard with a gigantic statue of Ramesses towering over the inner court. The temple itself consisted of three rooms with columns and terra-style cells dividing up the sanctuary. Throughout them stand many statues of the Egyptian gods and goddesses, while several colossal statues of Ramesses once adorned the temple. Unfortunately, several of these were removed from Thebes in the 19th century 
and are now found in places in Europe such as the British Museum. On what remains, reliefs commemorate Ramesses' victory at Kadesh and other accomplishments both inside and outside the temple. What is particularly interesting about the Ramesseum is that there is evidence that a scribal school was also established here, while a small royal palace stood next to the courtyard, indicating that this was a site with several other uses beyond its religious functions. It clearly served as a center of pharaonic government in Thebes when Ramesses based himself out of the traditional New Kingdom capital. Ramesses also ordered some construction work at Saqqara. This is a site not far from the Great Pyramids of Giza and where the first major pyramid ever built in ancient Egypt, that of Pharaoh Djoser of the Third Dynasty was built in the 27th century BC and Saqqara remained a major center of monumental building work over the centuries. Ramesses decided to make his own contributions to the complexes here, in association with one of his eldest sons, Prince Ha Emweset. For instance, the pair had the Pyramid of Unas, a pharaoh of the 5th dynasty who had lived in the 24th century BC, repaired and added an inscription to the southern facade of the edifice to indicate that they had overseen this restoration work. Ramesses and his son also enlarged the Temple of Serapis or Serapeum at Saqqara, a major center of the cult of Apis, the bull god of Egyptian mythology who was believed to be the physical manifestation of Ptah, the Egyptian god of crafts, merchants and the dead. Recent archaeological discoveries at Saqqara have also unearthed the tomb of Ptah Mwia, who served for a time as Grand Vizier and treasurer in the government of Ramesses II. His was not the only tomb built at Saqqara for senior government officials of Ramesses' reign, and the site at Saqqara highlights the esteem such bureaucrats were held in at the height of the new kingdom in ancient Egypt. One of the most significant aspects of Ramesses' building program was the manner in which he used grand temples and buildings as a way of expressing the extension of Egyptian power into regions which had largely become independent of pharaonic rule in the 14th century BC. This was particularly the case to the south towards Nubia along the course of the River Nile. Ramesses had many temples constructed here on the way to what is now Sudan as an expression of the rejuvenation of Egyptian rule here. One of the most impressive was the Temple of Beit al-Wali, which was built on an island in the middle of the River Nile, just a few kilometers from Aswan in southern Egypt. This was dedicated to some of the foremost Egyptian deities of the New Kingdom period, Amun-Ra, Rehorakti, Khnum, and Anuket. It is notable for having some of the best preserved and most impressive wall painting reliefs from ancient Egypt, many of which depict Ramesses' campaigns into Nubia and his subjugation of the region. His campaigns into Syria and Libya are also depicted. Over a hundred kilometers to the south, on the west bank of the River Nile, Ramesses had the two temples of Wadi es Sebur also constructed, renovating one earlier temple in the process. The site here was used as a stop-off point for boats traversing the Nile to and from Nubia. Ramesses thus had the temples constructed in a location where many people visited and dedicated them both to himself and Amun-Ra. Perhaps the most striking architectural feature here are rows of sphinxes which depicted Ramesses as individuals entered and left the temples. Perhaps the greatest building project undertaken by Ramesses, though, lay far to the south of Luxor near what is now the border between Egypt and Sudan at the Second Nile Cataract. This was the temple complex near what was then known as Ipsambul, but which we know today as Abu Simbel. Here Ramesses had initiated the construction of two temples back in the mid-1260s. They would take 20 years to complete but eventually resulted in two large temples carved in a sheer rock face near the village. One of these was dedicated to Ramesses himself, and the smaller one was in honor of the pharaoh's primary consort, Queen Nefertari. When it was completed in 1244 BC, the great temple was inscribed as having been built as, quote, the Temple of Ramesses, beloved of Amun. It consisted of a grand entrance 
which led into a temple dedicated to several of the major Egyptian deities. Sculptures and reliefs adorned the interior. It is also believed that the temple was built in such a way that the chamber flooded with sunlight on the 22nd of October and the 22nd of February every year, illuminating the statues here. It is speculated that these dates are significant as possibly being the dates of Ramesses' birth and coronation as pharaoh. Moreover, the reliefs and sculptures are celebratory of Ramesses' reign, with his military campaigns and his victories depicted on the walls, notably the Battle of Kadesh. While the interior of the Temple of Abu Simbel is impressive, the most notable aspect of the temple complex is the series of colossal statues, which were erected on either side of the main entrance outside the temple. At the Grand Temple, there are four such colossal statues, two to either side of the entrance. All four of these depict Ramesses and stand approximately 20 meters tall, making them some of the largest pharaonic statues ever carved during the three millennia of ancient Egyptian history. It is difficult to get a precise idea of how vast these statues are from looking at photographs, but if one stands next to them, an individual only reaches up to the pharaoh's feet, with the remainder of the statues towering well above. On each statue, Ramesses was depicted wearing the dual crowns of Upper and Lower Egypt. A statement here in the border region between Egypt and Nubia that the pharaoh was lord of the land of the river Nile, both to the south and the north. Thus, the temple of Abu Simbel was meant as a statement of Ramesses' power and rule over Egypt, a proclamation of sorts to those south of Abu Simbel that the pharaohs reigned here yet again. Abu Simbel is the pinnacle of Ramesses' building program. Ramesses' reign is notable for its length. Having most likely succeeded his father in 1279 BC, he is believed to have ruled for over 65 years. However, what is somewhat unusual about this long reign is how unremarkable the second half of it was, and in particular, the last two decades or so of Ramesses' reign. All of the notable events of his time as pharaoh, from the Battle of Kadesh to the Eternal Treaty and the campaigns west to Libya and south into Nubia, all occurred in the first 20 or so years of his rule. Even the monumental building programs, which he undertook at Abu Simbel, Thebes and elsewhere, although many of them took upwards of 20 years to complete, were generally finished by the early 1230s BC. By way of comparison, the last 20 or so years of Ramesses II's reign are something of a mystery. There is little evidence of major events or what he may have been doing. This is quite possibly because the pharaoh spent many years ill towards the end of his life and with his health declining. Scientific analysis of his mummy in recent times has revealed that Ramesses suffered from a range of ailments in old age, including arthritis, atherosclerosis and severe dental issues, but he survived for an immense amount of time despite these illnesses. Such evidence as we have indicates Ramesses II did not die until 1213 BC in the 66th year of his reign, probably aged around 90, an extraordinarily long life by the standards of the time. He was originally interred in the Valley of the Kings, where many pharaohs were interred in the hills outside Thebes, but owing to looting of the graves here, his body was moved on several occasions. Like all the ancient pharaohs, he was mummified meaning that his body was partially preserved across the centuries. Ramesses was succeeded by his son Merneptah, who took the regnal name ba en re meri Netjeru, which means the soul of Ra, beloved of the gods. This Merneptah is believed to have been the 13th son of Ramesses, a development which should have placed him well down the pecking order of possible successors to his father, However, Ramesses had lived for so long that a huge number of his older sons had died. Indeed, Merneptah was probably well into his sixties by the time of his own accession and his reign would only last ten years. The most significant development during his reign was a victory which he won over the tribes of Libya at the Battle of Perire in 1208 BC. Thereafter, there was a quick succession of pharaohs before the 19th dynasty came to an end, with the dying out of Ramesses' direct line of descent in 1189 BC. Thus, 
The dynasty lasted for just over a century and was completely dominated by the reign of Ramesses II. However, in recognition of the extraordinary reign of Ramesses the Great, many pharaohs of the 20th dynasty adopted his regnal name. In all, there were eventually 11 Ramesses, the last being Ramesses XI of the 20th dynasty, who died around 1077 BC. In death, Ramesses II has acquired an even greater historical fame over the years, as it has been regularly speculated that he is the pharaoh of the story of the Book of Exodus in the Old Testament. This is one of the earliest sections of the Old Testament, and is central to both Judaism and Christianity. In it, the story of the Jews, who are effectively living as slaves in what is termed the Land of Goshen, but which is Pharaonic Egypt, is related. This picks up from the book of Genesis, which had related how Joseph, the son of the Hebrew prophet Jacob, had been tricked by his brothers and sold into slavery in Egypt. Over the next several generations, a large community of Jewish slaves came to live in Egypt under the subjugation of the Egyptian pharaohs. In Exodus, we read the story of how the Jewish prophet Moses is placed in a reed basket and sent down the river Nile by his mother Jochebed. After the pharaoh had ordered the murder of Jewish children following concern about the number of Jews or Israelites that were then present in Egypt, Moses is subsequently found and adopted into the pharaoh's household where he gains the affection of the Egyptian king. But Moses clashes with the pharaoh's biological son. Eventually, he realizes he is one of the Israelites and leads his people out of Egypt by parting the Red Sea as the pharaoh's forces attempt to chase him. The debate on Ramesses is whether he could be identified as being either the ruling pharaoh of the book of Exodus or his biological son who becomes Moses' rival. There is really no substantive case, however, in either instance for speculating to this effect. The book of Exodus makes no effort to identify the historical figures who might have been involved in Pharaonic Egypt at the time, and the historicity of the events of the Old Testament are, of course, open to speculation as well. Consequently, different writers have speculated that a wide range of pharaohs dating from as early as the 17th century BC and as late as the 12th century BC may be the pharaoh of the book of Exodus or his biological son. An unusually high proportion of people have been anxious to suggest it was Ramesses II who was the pharaoh at the time, with this line being favoured in more than one prominent Hollywood treatment of Moses' life, notably the Ten Commandments of 1956, in which Ramesses was depicted by Yul Brynner. These depictions are largely due to Ramesses being the most prominent pharaoh of this age. His reign was lengthy and he was involved in military conquests in the Levant, which would fit with oppression of the Israelites. These things aside though, there is no historical basis for suggesting that Ramesses II is the pharaoh of the Book of Exodus. Indeed, that Ramesses should be identified with the biblical pharaoh of Exodus is perhaps fitting. After all, much of the tale of Moses portends doom for Egypt for impeding the destiny of the Israelites to return to their ancestral homeland and establish a new kingdom there. And there is no doubting that New Kingdom Egypt quickly headed towards a period of immense decline shortly after Ramesses' reign. Beginning around 1200 BC, the eastern Mediterranean, the Levant and adjoining areas was struck by a series of attacks by a mysterious confederation of warlike people who have typically been identified as the Sea Peoples. There is no consensus even today as to who these people were or where they had come from, although it has plausibly been speculated that they came eastwards from the western Mediterranean, possibly from Italy and parts of southern France or the northwestern Balkans. Wherever they came from, what we do know is that the onslaught of these newcomers along with the arrival of other warlike peoples such as the Dorians who came from northern Greece around this time was an immediate threat to the late Bronze Age world and began to destabilize societies such as those of New Kingdom Egypt in the decades that followed.
What followed is typically referred to as the Late Bronze Age collapse in the historiography of the ancient world, as the powerful states which had dominated the region for several centuries either declined dramatically or collapsed. The Hittite Empire splintered into several smaller states during the course of the 12th century BC, while Bronze Age Mycenae and the Minoan civilization of Crete were almost entirely destroyed. New Kingdom Egypt also entered a period of pronounced decline, though it survived as a substantial polity, albeit much weakened internally, divided by civil wars and reduced in terms of its territorial expanse. This reflected much of what occurred elsewhere. Trade collapsed across the Bronze Age world for the space of two centuries or more, and the economy was so impacted that whole cities were abandoned and famines struck many regions such that many historians of the ancient past refer to this as being a dark age of the ancient world, similar to what followed the collapse of the Roman Empire nearly two millennia later. What is known as the Third Intermediate Period of Egyptian history followed the end of the New Kingdom, as new regional powers began to dominate what remained of Pharaonic Egypt, some of them hailing from Nubia in the south. Ramesses II's tomb was discovered during the late 19th century. This was a time when Egyptology, the study of Pharaonic Egypt, was entering its first golden age following the deciphering of Egyptian hieroglyphics using the Rosetta Stone. The great pharaoh's tomb was discovered at Deir al-Bahari in 1881 near Thebes, within a wider cache of royal tombs dating to the New Kingdom period. Ramesses' tomb, like nearly all other pharaohs, had been looted at some stage in the past and revealed nothing to rival the riches of that of Tutankhamun, which would be discovered 40 years later by Howard Carter. However, Ramesses' tomb is nevertheless significant, particularly a series of inscriptions on the sarcophagus which listed Ramesses' various names and titles and also provided an inventory of his burial goods, the inscriptions also indicate that Ramesses was not immediately interred at Deir al-Bahari, but rather he was first laid to rest in the tomb of his father, Seti I. It remained there for the next 80 years, until such time in the mid-12th century that his tomb was relocated. What is especially strange about all of this is that Egyptologists now believe that the wooden and painted death mask and sarcophagus used in Ramesses' new tomb were actually recycled from the tomb of one of his near successors, Horemheb, the last ruler of the 18th dynasty. It is also evident that renovations were carried out on Ramesses' tomb in subsequent years, indicating that the ancient Egyptians did not simply seal the tombs of dead pharaohs for all time when they were laid to rest, but viewed some of these tombs as shrines which were to be maintained and improved where possible. Unsurprisingly, given the extent of the building program he oversaw, Ramesses II has continued to feature regularly in studies of ancient Egypt and new archaeological projects. Indeed, in the case of Abu Simbel, his temple here was central to one of the most extraordinary relocation projects ever undertaken. In the 1950s, the new government of General Abdel Nasser, who had seized power in Egypt following the Egyptian Revolution of 1952, determined to build a vast new dam at Aswan in order to henceforth control the annual flooding or inundation of the River Nile on which so much of the country's agriculture depended. The resulting flooding and the creation of what was to be named Lake Nasser near the dam would have submerged Abu Simbel. Accordingly, in 1959, the Egyptian government applied to UNESCO to move the temple. This petition was granted and over the next several years, several Swedish engineering firms undertook the project for the Egyptian government. The work involved was highly complex, as Abu Simbel was not constructed out of blocks of stone, but was carved into a cliff face. Thus, the temple was rescued by effectively making a giant incision into the mountainside and then transplanting the temple piece by piece to a site several hundred meters inland and much higher above ground. Thus, Abu Simbel now overlooks the River Nile, much as it has for over three millennia, but from a different vantage point and site. Owing to the length of his reign and its significance, Ramesses has also featured extensively in modern popular culture. 
For instance, Norman Mailer's Ancient Evenings, published in 1983 by the American author, was an enormous fictional account of pharaonic Egypt set on one evening in the late 12th century BC, but in which the characters repeatedly discuss the reign of Ramesses II. The Battle of Kadesh is a major feature of the work. Ramesses was also the subject of works by the noted historical fiction writer Christian Jack, while he is the central character too of Anne Rice's The Mummy. So too does he appear in many numerous Hollywood treatments of ancient Egypt. But surely the most notable popular cultural reference to the victor of the Battle of Kadesh appeared two centuries ago in the romantic poet Percy Bysshe Shelley's poem Ozymandias, the Greek name for Ramesses. Here Shelley used Ramesses as an example of how all great rulers are destined for decline or death. It was meant to be a reflection by Shelley primarily on Napoleon Bonaparte, who had fallen from power in France and Europe just a few years before Shelley's time of writing. But Shelley used Ramesses as his analogy, as news was circulating around London at the time that the British Museum had just acquired one of the colossal heads of the pharaoh from the Ramesseum. Shelley's repetition of the inscription which once adorned the tomb, My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings, look on my works, ye mighty, and despair, must rank as amongst some of the most famous lines of 19th century poetry. Ramesses II, or Ramesses the Great, was arguably the greatest of all ancient Egypt's pharaohs, of which there were over 170 across three millennia. His reign is notable for many things. From a political and military perspective, he extended the Egyptian kingdom to the greatest point it had seen since the reign of Thutmose III two centuries earlier, the point at which Egypt reached its greatest extremity by conquering much of the Levant, Syria, and parts of Mesopotamia. Ramesses did this primarily by defeating the Hittites in his nation's ongoing struggle with them for hegemony over the rich coastal cities of Canaan and Syria such as Tyre and Sidon. The peak of his success in this respect was victory at the Battle of Kadesh and the Eternal Treaty of 1259 BC. But it was not just here where Ramesses was militarily successful. He also campaigned against the Sherdan Sea Pirates early on in his reign which had been plaguing the northern coast of Egypt for many years prior to his accession and later campaigned westwards along the Mediterranean coast towards Libya. Finally, to the south, he extended the Egyptian kingdom's influence much further down the course of the River Nile into what is now Sudan, but which was then known as Nubia. This new kingdom empire of Ramesses II was one of the most formidable empires of ancient times. However, there is also the distinct possibility that Ramesses has been accorded the prominence which he has in studies of ancient Egypt and amongst Egyptologists owing to his own self-promotion. Ramesses was one of history's first great propagandists. There was no success which he achieved on the battlefield or aspect of his reign that he did not commemorate in stone in such a way as it would be remembered for centuries or even millennia to come. Thus, for instance, we find him setting stone stelae and other markers in the Nile Delta and the Levant to proclaim his victories over the Hittites and the Sherdan Sea Pirates there to the world and to future generations. But it was his building program in places like Luxor, Saqqara and above all Abu Simbel, way down the Nile near Aswan which afforded him his greatest legacy. Here in stone he proclaimed to all his magnificence as a ruler his ties to the sun god Ra and his many military accomplishments. Yet while these building works may have been acts of propaganda, there is no denying their brilliance. Accordingly, from the perspective of the 21st century, surely Ramesses' greatest accomplishment was in having these magnificent temples, statues and obelisks erected across Egypt nearly 3,500 years ago. What do you think of Ramesses the Great? Was he ancient Egypt's greatest pharaoh? Or is the greatness of his legacy partly due to a shrewd policy of propaganda concerning his building projects as well as his promotion of his own military victories? Please let us know in the comment section and in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.
The man known to history as Emperor Haile Selassie I was born on the 23rd of July 1892 in the town of Ejazogoro, not far from the city of Harar in Ethiopia. He was given the name Lij Tavari Makonen in his youth. Lij simply means child of, while Tavari means one who is respected or feared. Makonen was his father's name, and so, as he was growing up, he was known as the child of Makonen, who is greatly respected. His father, Ras Makonen, was the governor of the ancient walled city of Harar in eastern Ethiopia, and a key advisor to his near kinsman, Emperor Menelik II, who was emperor at the time. Thus, Lich Tavari Makonen was born into a significant noble family which was related to the current imperial dynasty. Through his paternal grandmother, Tafari was descended from the Solomonic line of kings, who had ruled this part of Africa since the 13th century. Tafari's mother was Boizero Yeshimebet Ali, the daughter of a ruling chief from Wolo province to the north. Any exploration of Tafari's life must start by exploring the nature of Ethiopian society and the empire that ruled it in the late 19th century. Ethiopia and the wider Horn of Africa have a unique history. 1700 years ago, when the Roman Empire ruled all of North Africa, Roman Egypt emerged as a major early center of Christianity in the Eastern Mediterranean. Soon, the new religion spread south beyond the borders of the Roman Empire, down the River Nile and the coast of the Red Sea. It gained many adherents in what is now Ethiopia, which effectively became a Christian country. However, with the Arab conquests of the Middle East and North Africa in the 7th century AD, Ethiopia was effectively cut off from the rest of the Christian world, but it did not convert to Islam. Accordingly, over the centuries, a unique form of Christianity developed here, one which continued to adhere to many of the rites which were typical of the 4th century church. Moreover, Ethiopian politics and culture became shrouded in biblical legend, and from the 13th century onwards, the rulers of the kingdom of Ethiopia claimed to be descended from the biblical king Solomon. Therefore, their dynastic line has become known as the Solomonic dynasty. This Solomonic dynasty ruled a kingdom which centuries ago only constituted part of northern Ethiopia, but between the 13th and 19th centuries, it began expanding to the south, west and east eventually covering an area approximate to modern-day Ethiopia. As it did so, the Ethiopian Empire became a multicultural state, one which had many different ethnic peoples living under the rule of the emperors. The foremost of these were the Oromo and Amhara people, who between them made up over half the population of the empire. But significant minorities included the Somalis in the far south and east of the country and the Tigrayans in the northeast. These different ethnicities spoke different languages and had somewhat different appearances. For instance, the Oromo are a Cushitic people who dominated the northwestern part of the country and had been more responsive to the spread of Islam into the region. The Amhara are a Semitic people who dominated the highlands of Ethiopia and were much more committed to Oriental Orthodox Christianity. These ethnic and religious divisions would influence Selassie's rule and indeed the entire history of modern Ethiopia. Indeed, so central are they to the country's history that the alternative name which was used for the Ethiopian Empire at the time of Tafari's birth was Abyssinia, from the Arabic Habasa term for mixture, a reference to the multicultural nature of the empire. By the mid-19th century, the Ethiopian Empire had become one of the most powerful states in Africa, and it needed to be. For the great European powers were entering into a period of accelerated colonization of the continent. To the north, Egypt had effectively become a British protectorate, and British rule was being extended down the River Nile into Sudan, Ethiopia's western neighbor, and eventually into Uganda and Kenya, the southern neighbors of Abyssinia. To the east of Abyssinia, along the coastline of the Horn of Africa, a number of European powers acquired territory through treaties and military intervention in the years leading up to Tafari's birth. The foremost of these was the Kingdom of Italy, which acquired the colonies of Italian Somaliland and Eritrea in the 1880s, comprising most of the modern-day countries of Eritrea and Somalia. 
the British and French also carved out small enclaves in northern Somaliland. In the end, nearly all of Africa was annexed by the European powers in what has become known as the Scramble for Africa. However, Abyssinia avoided this fate, in large part because Emperor Menelik II, who came to power in 1889, began a program of modernization. He established Addis Ababa as a strong new capital in the center of the empire and developed an alliance with the Russian Empire from 1893 onwards. Through this, the Russians sent military advisors, scientists and economists to Abyssinia to advise the country on how to modernize its government, economy and military, with a view to withstanding encroachments by the Italians, British, French and others. Thus, when Tafari was born in 1892, a new era of Ethiopian history was beginning. As a son of a major Ethiopian noble, Tafari was afforded honors from a young age. For instance, when he was just 13 years old, he was given the title of Dejaz Mach of Gara Mulata, an administrative region near the city of Harar. Dejaz Mach literally means keeper of the door and shows that he was a protector of sorts of the region, while still barely a teenager. Yet, there was little sign at this time that he would ascend to a position of imperial authority. For, despite the fact that he was related to the imperial family, Emperor Menelik II had a clear line of succession in place. He had two daughters, Sharega and Zeuditu. Through these, Menelik had several grandsons, one of whom, Lij Iyasu, the son of Sharega, was eventually designated by Menelik as his successor. Meanwhile, Tafari's youth also saw a concerted effort by the Kingdom of Italy to connect its two colonies of Eritrea and Somaliland by conquering Abyssinia. In 1895, the Italians invaded Abyssinia, but Emperor Menelik's modernization efforts proved beneficial, and the short-lived First Italo-Ethiopian War ended a year later in 1896, when an Italian invasion force of some 15,000 men were decisively defeated by a much larger Ethiopian army of upwards of 75,000 at the Battle of Adwa. With this, Abyssinia's independence was secured for a generation. In his teenage years, Tafari was promoted further within the empire. In 1907, for instance, he was appointed as a governor of the province of Sidamo in the south of Ethiopia. He sired a daughter during this time, the future Princess Romanwok, though the identity of her mother is not entirely certain. In 1911, he married Menen Asfau, also a member of the imperial family. This was around the time when Emperor Menelik II, who was nearing his 70th year, became increasingly more incapacitated due to a series of strokes he had suffered. He eventually died in 1913, leaving his 18-year-old grandson, Liju Yasu, as the emperor-designate. Yasu had been serving as de facto emperor for some time by 1913, on account of his grandfather's illness. Under such circumstances, this might have allowed him to solidify his position in advance of the emperor's death, but instead the direct opposite had occurred. Yasu had found himself increasingly opposed by the council of ministers which his grandfather had established and even by his own aunt, Menelik's younger daughter, Princess Zeuditu. Thus, when Menelik finally died in December 1913, the Council of Ministers and the Princess suppressed news of his passing and did not confirm Yasu as the new emperor. He was left to enjoy some semblance of power in the months that followed, but his accession would never be proclaimed and he would never be given an imperial name. There were multiple reasons for this opposition to Yasu. Firstly, in the final years of Menelik's reign, the young prince had shown himself disinclined to the kind of administration and management which was necessary for the ruler of a rapidly modernizing empire. Secondly, and more importantly, there were concerns that he was disposed to Islam over the Christian faith, which was central to Ethiopian political life. The latter issue was unacceptable to the Council of Ministers, and when rumors that Yasu had converted to Islam mounted in the mid-1910s, they moved to depose him as emperor in the autumn of 1916. He was placed under arrest and would spend the rest of his life down to the mid-1930s in detention. Following his removal from power, Zoditu was proclaimed as Empress of Ethiopia. But with the succession now unsure, it was decided that her cousin, Lij Tavari Makonen, 
the future Emperor Haile Selassie would be appointed as her regent and designated successor. Evidently, Tafari's tenure as a regional governor of several provinces in the late 1900s and into the 1910s had been successful, and he had weathered the political intrigue of the years of Yasu's brief reign very well. Thus, the stage was set for Tafari to one day succeed Zeudi II, who was entering her forties when she became empress and did not have any other clear successor. In the years that followed, a clear delineation developed within the government of Abyssinia between Empress Zuditu and the regent Tafari. She was a traditionalist and a conservative ruler, while he was following the path hewn by Emperor Menelik II in wishing to modernize Ethiopia. In theory, the empress was by far the more powerful figure, but her position was weaker than any of her predecessors as ruler of Abyssinia for the simple reason that she was a woman in a society which prioritized male rule. As such, Tafari was able to claim a great deal more influence than would have been typical of the power dynamic between them in most other circumstances. Both had their factions. She was favored by the Ethiopian church, which looked kindly on her conservative values, while Tafari was supported by a clear majority of the Council of Ministers. Eventually, in the course of the 1920s, he emerged as the more powerful figure, and long before her rule would end, Zodito had begun to withdraw from government and allowed Tafari to continue his modernization efforts in the 1920s. The modernization program, which was implemented in the 1920s, was multifaceted. Much of it centered on trying to modernize the government and administration of Abyssinia to make it more like those of the European powers. There was a precedent for this. The non-European power which had modernized most effectively in the 19th century was the Empire of Japan. It had done so by adopting Western methods and had thus resisted Western encroachments and established itself as a major power itself in the Far East by the 1920s. Abyssinia aimed to at least partially emulate this approach. Thus, a Western-style government was established by Tafari, one with ministers responsible for individual aspects of governance. In tandem, there was a move away from the feudal nature of Ethiopian government to a political system where individuals were promoted based on their abilities rather than their noble rank. Finally, Abyssinia applied for membership in the newly established League of Nations, a forerunner of the United Nations. It became a member in 1923, one of the few non-Western nations to ever become a member of the League. Even more significant were the attempted economic and social reforms which were introduced during the reign of Empress Zeuditu and the Regency of Tafari. Already the first electricity grids had been introduced to Addis Ababa in the mid-1910s, and this was expanded outwards in the 1920s. At the same time, efforts were initiated to begin linking the main cities with roads and eventually railway lines. The telegraph and other communication systems, which had become commonplace in the Western world in the second half of the 19th century, also finally arrived to Abyssinia, albeit in a limited fashion. The National Bank of Ethiopia was founded in 1927 to bolster the economy and excessive lending rates were prohibited. Perhaps most importantly, the judicial system was overhauled with the Feta Negas Law Code, a legal system which had been used in Ethiopia for centuries and which imposed brutal punishments for moderate crimes, such as the loss of a hand for being found guilty of theft, was gradually phased out in favor of a Western judicial system based on elements of the civil and common law. But there was a major backward element to Abyssinian society which remained. Slavery was still widespread here, a century after it had been prohibited throughout much of the Western world. Tokenistic efforts were made to end this in the 1920s as the Western powers criticized the retention of the system in Ethiopia, but Tafari was unwilling to commit to any major efforts to eliminate it from Abyssinian society at this time. Meanwhile, Tafari's international reputation was growing, and by the end of the 1920s, he was increasingly viewed as the face of Abyssinia on the world stage rather than the Empress. Much of this was owing to numerous trips abroad and state visits. For instance, in 1924, he undertook a tour of numerous foreign capitals and major cities with other members of the extended imperial family and the government, 
This was a fact-finding mission as much as anything else, as Tafari and others sought to gain from direct experience of the Western societies they were attempting to emulate. The Abyssinian delegation, with its ostentatious displays of wealth and court ritual, made a significant impression in London and Paris, where Tafari met King George V and the French Prime Minister, Raymond Poincaire. Another significant goal of this foreign tour was to try to convince the British and French governments to provide Abyssinia with access to the Red Sea by surrendering some territory in its colonial enclaves in Somaliland. Elsewhere, in the Middle East and North Africa, Tafari was greeted warmly as the all but head of state of virtually the only African nation which had withstood European colonization in the 19th century. All of this ensured that, before he would ever become emperor, Tafari was well established on the international stage. By 1928, Tafari's position at home in Abyssinia was such that the Empress could not but promote him ever further. By this time, he had monopolized power within the Council of Ministers and, more importantly, had also moved to secure the loyalty of the heads of the military and police forces. Thus, on the 7th of October 1928, he was crowned as Negus, an Abyssinian title equivalent to a king, though still below that of Emperor or Empress. This replaced his earlier honorific of Ras, which had signified his position within the imperial line. In the months that followed, tensions began to brew between the Empress's faction and that of Tafari, ultimately culminating in January 1930 in the outbreak of a borderline civil war between Tafari and Gugsawela, the Empress's husband. He not only wished to reassert his wife's authority within the empire, but now had designs of replacing Tafari as the head of the government and having himself crowned as emperor. Guxawela's rebellion culminated in a major meeting of his forces and the supporters of Tafari at the Battle of Anchem on the 31st of March 1930. But with their superior Western armaments and methods, which included the use of modern aircraft, Tafari's supporters quickly defeated Gugsawela's army. He himself was killed in the fighting. Then, in a seemingly unconnected development, the Empress died of natural causes just two days later, clearing the way for Tafari to claim absolute power in Abyssinia after years of dual rule between him and the Empress. A mourning period of over half a year was imposed following the passing of Empress Zeuditu. But at last, on the 2nd of November 1930, Tafari was proclaimed as the new emperor of Abyssinia and crowned that same day at the Cathedral of St. George in Addis Ababa. Emissaries from many Western nations attended the event, and Tafari featured on the cover of Time magazine that November. He also adopted a new name and title. The title he obtained was now Negusa Nagast, the King of Kings, while his imperial name would be Haile Selassie. Haile means power of, and Selassie means trinity, so the name Haile Selassie effectively means the power of the trinity. However, as we will see later, the former name he bore for much of the 1920s, Ras Tafari, was to gain currency again in later years and become increasingly well-known globally. More immediately, in the early 1930s, just after his accession as Emperor Haile Selassie I, the new ruler of Ethiopia quickly oversaw the introduction of Ethiopia's first modern constitution in 1931. This provided for the establishment of a bicameral legislature, with a parliament and an upper house of lords, with whom the emperor would share power. It was also intended that a new constitution would further lead to the end of the Feta Nagest legal system and its replacement with a Western judicial code. The first years of Selassie's reign as emperor were marked by his efforts to continue and expand the modernization program he had first initiated as regent in the 1920s. However, a shadow was increasingly hanging over Ethiopia. Back in 1922, the Italian government had been taken over by the National Fascist Party led by Benito Mussolini after the infamous march on Rome by 30,000 paramilitary fascist blackshirts. One of Mussolini's great desires was to build Italy into a great power again and to resurrect the empire Italians had enjoyed back in the days of Rome two millennia earlier. To that end, in the 1920s, he had engaged in a series of aggressive actions 
initiating a brutal war of conquest in Libya, which had been a nominal colony of Italy's since 1912, as well as bombing the island of Corfu during a dispute with the Kingdom of Greece, annexing the city of Fiume in what is now Croatia and establishing a protectorate over Albania through a series of treaties in the mid-1920s. With these advances made, in the early 1930s, Mussolini's attentions turned to the Horn of Africa, where he increasingly wished to correct what he deemed to be an historical failing of Italy's, its loss to Ethiopia in the first Italo-Ethiopian War back in the 1890s. If Abyssinia could be conquered, it would also make a continuous colony of Italy's lands in Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Italian Somaliland, in turn making it the predominant colonial power in the Horn of Africa. In 1934, tensions between Selassie's government and the Italian colonial administration in Eritrea and Somaliland began to flare over a long-running boundary dispute which had been caused by Italy's wish to build a railway line through the region connecting its two divided colonies, which Ethiopia was in the middle of. This had culminated in Italy building a military fort at Walwal in eastern Ethiopia. In December 1934, the Italian presence here was challenged by Selassie's government when Abyssinian troops were sent to Walwal. On the 5th of December, this led to violent engagements between the Italians and the Ethiopians, resulting in dozens of deaths on both sides. An international diplomatic standoff followed, now known as the Abyssinia Crisis. In early January 1935, Selassie's government protested to the League of Nations. Months of diplomatic toing and froing would follow, but essentially the British and French governments, who were best placed to act as intermediaries, were unwilling to block Italian aggression at a time when they were trying to win over Mussolini as an ally in Europe, in the face of the rise of the Nazis following Adolf Hitler's seizure of power in Germany in 1933. Consequently, while negotiations followed for months, it eventually became clear to Selassie's government that the Italians were intent on using the Walwal incident in December 1934 and the ensuing diplomatic standoff as an excuse to declare war on Abyssinia and that the League of Nations was not going to take any effective measures to try to stop Mussolini's aggression. The Second Italo-Abyssinian War commenced on the 3rd of October 1935, when the Italian general Emilio di Bono crossed over the border from Italy's colony of Eritrea into northern Ethiopia with tens of thousands of Italian troops. There was no formal declaration of war. This was to be one of the most significant conflicts globally during the interwar period between the First World War and the Second World War, eventually involving hundreds of thousands of troops and personnel on both sides. It would last for just over a half a year. The sides were evenly matched throughout, though. While the Ethiopians were numerically superior, despite the best efforts to modernize their army since the 1890s, their forces were still resoundingly based on mass infantry divisions. For instance, Selassie's government had just a handful of tanks, and the Ethiopian Air Force consisted of little more than a dozen planes. By way of contrast, Mussolini's government was eventually able to deploy hundreds of tanks in East Africa, as well as massive artillery barrages and a significant air force presence. Thus, while the Italian army would be shown in later years to be enormously deficient in European terms, the war which was initiated in the autumn of 1935 was clearly a David versus Goliath type conflict in which the Italians had the upper hand in a way which they had not back in 1895 when the first Italo-Ethiopian war was launched. In response to the invasion of Abyssinia, the League of Nations sanctioned Italy on the 7th of October 1935, four days after the initial incursion by de Bono's troops. The two primary countries within the League to whom the responsibility fell for challenging the Italian government's actions were Britain and France, who were the foremost colonial powers across the African continent and who had colonies nearby themselves in Somaliland and all across Ethiopia's western and southern borders in Sudan and Kenya in the case of Britain. Yet while the conservative-led national government of Stanley Baldwin in Britain campaigned on and won an election in November 1935 on the premise of supporting the League of Nations and its mission, Baldwin's government almost immediately capitulated to Italian aggression. Within days of arriving in office, 
the new British Foreign Secretary Samuel Hoare was engaged in talks with his French counterpart Pierre Laval, who was also the French Prime Minister at the time, about how the war could be quickly brought to an end. Here, the desire to appease Italy and prevent it from drifting closer to Nazi Germany was paramount, and the Hoare-Laval Pact details of which were leaked by the British press in early December, effectively outlined a plan whereby Abyssinia would lose roughly half of its territory to Italy, allowing the Italians to connect their colonies of Eritrea and Somaliland. This was completely unacceptable to Selassie's government and a complete betrayal of the mandate of the League of Nations. Outrage followed. Hoare resigned as British Foreign Minister and ultimately the revelation of details of the pact brought to an end any efforts to find a diplomatic solution to the conflict. The Hoare-Laval Pact and the wider Abyssinia crisis is generally seen as also sounding the death knell of the League of Nations, an institution which had now conclusively proven its inability to prevent aggressive nations like Italy and the Empire of Japan from invading its enemies with no justification. With the termination of diplomatic negotiations in December 1935, the war intensified on the ground in Abyssinia. By now, the Ethiopian government was making preparations for its own counteroffensive against the Italian incursion in the north. This was led by Selassie in person and had hoped to sever the Italian lines of communication and launch a counter-invasion of Eritrea. Initially, it met with considerable success but in the early months of 1936, the tide turned once General Pietro Badoglio, who had previously overseen the Italian campaign in Libya, was appointed as governor of Eritrea and the leader of the military effort in succession to De Bono, whose oversight of the invasion had been deemed too cautious by Mussolini. Badoglio initiated a brutal campaign in January 1936, in which poison gas was widely used against the Ethiopian armies. Through these methods, a series of victories were quickly won by Badoglio at the battles of Tembien, Amba Aradam and Shire in northern Ethiopia in the late winter and early spring of 1936. A final effort to maintain the northern front by Selassie was defeated at the Battle of Mechu on the 31st of March 1936, following which northern Ethiopia was effectively under Italian control. On the 26th of April 1936, Badoglio launched what he termed the March of the Iron Will, a swift drive southwards from the northern front around Desi in Wallo province towards the Abyssinian capital of Addis Ababa, a distance of some 200 kilometers. The campaign was accompanied by much fanfare and propaganda in the fascist media back home in Italy. A large mechanized column was the centerpiece of this drive, with over 2,000 tanks cars, trucks and other vehicles included in the operation, which transported some 12,500 Italian troops speedily towards Selassie's capital. By now, the Ethiopian armies were decimated from the northern offensive and, as the Italians neared Addis Ababa in early May, the emperor and his family fled from the capital and made their way towards the border with French Somaliland crossing over as Selassie went into what would be years of exile from his realm. Three days later, at roughly 4 p.m. on the afternoon of the 5th of May 1936, Badoglio arrived in Addis Ababa at the front of a column of 1,700 vehicles. In the hours that followed, Italian troops began entering the city in what was more of a procession than an actual siege and occupied prominent buildings all over the capital. The war was now effectively over. The Second Italo-Ethiopian War came to an end in May 1936 with the fall of Addis Ababa and the flight of Emperor Haile Selassie from Ethiopia. However, pockets of resistance remained, particularly in the south and west of the country, which were still unoccupied by any Italian forces. Accordingly, fighting would continue for months and years to come. Indeed, all of Abyssinia was never actually brought under effective Italian control. Yet, from May 1936, the Italian government claimed to have won the war. As such, the new colony of Italian Ethiopia was declared to be in existence by Mussolini on the 9th of May 1936. However, this was soon annexed into the newly proclaimed colony of Italian East Africa, which incorporated Abyssinia, Eritrea, 
and Italian Somaliland, and which stretched all the way across the Horn of Africa, completing the ambition for Italy to create a contiguous colony here 40 years after it had first been attempted in the mid-1890s. Here, the Italians would impose a brutal form of colonial governance, following many of the quasi-genocidal policies which had been developed in Libya in the 1920s of confining thousands of people to concentration camps and favoring a divide and rule policy, whereby the different ethnic peoples of Ethiopia were pitted against each other. With the Italians now largely in control of his country, Emperor Selassie made his way to Europe. His first mission was to present Abyssinia's case at the League of Nations in Geneva. However, his timing was far from propitious. In Europe, Nazi Germany had initiated an aggressive program of military rearmament in 1935, and in the spring of 1936, while Selassie was fighting in northern Ethiopia, Hitler had ordered his troops into the Rhineland of Western Germany, which German troops had been prevented from entering under the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, the treaty that brought the First World War to an end. Consequently, the governments of Britain and France were no more willing to adopt an aggressive stance against Italy in 1936 than they had been the previous autumn. Nevertheless, while his efforts at redress were in vain, Selassie gained acclaim for a speech he made at a meeting of the League on the 12th of May 1936, in the course of which he denounced the rise of fascism and the use of poison gas by the Italians in East Africa. He was subsequently named Time Magazine's Man of the Year, but the result for Ethiopia was the same. The League was unwilling to take concerted action against Italy, which in any event withdrew from membership of it in December 1937. Meanwhile, Selassie headed for England where he would live in exile throughout the late 1930s. While he was in exile in England, the world's politics was in continual flux. Germany's aggression intensified in 1938 with the annexation of Austria and then Czechoslovakia in 1939. When the Nazis invaded Poland the following September, Britain and France declared war, triggering the start of the Second World War. For the time being, Mussolini adopted a cautious stance and did not enter the war. But when the Germans undertook a blistering military campaign in the summer of 1940 that effectively brought continental Western Europe under Berlin's control, the Italians decided to side with Hitler, declaring war on Britain and France on the 10th of June 1940 and invading southeastern France in an effort to acquire territory there. What this now meant was that the Italians and the British would square off to each other in East Africa. On the 13th of June 1940, an Italian air raid was launched against British Kenya in the first action of the East Africa campaign. This was all part of a wider Italian initiative to conquer Britain's colonies in Egypt and Sudan, and thus unite Italian East Africa with Italy's growing expanse of territory in North Africa. At first, these campaigns proceeded well for Mussolini, but by early 1941, the weaknesses of the Italian military were becoming wholly apparent. Early in 1941, with Italian operations in the Sahara Desert faltering, Mussolini called on Hitler for aid. A German expeditionary force, the famous Africa Corps, led by Erwin Rommel, was dispatched to North Africa that March, but there would be no major military support offered to the Italian position in East Africa. Thus, in the course of 1941, the British gradually turned the tide here and began pushing the Italians back into Ethiopia and Eritrea after their initial advances into Sudan and Kenya. By this time, Selassie had left Britain and had returned to the Horn of Africa to oversee parts of the campaign to reclaim his homeland from the Italians himself. The fighting here was undertaken by a broad mix of British, Ethiopian, Eritrean, Free French and Free Belgian forces. Crucially, they had naval superiority, and by early 1941, a new front was being opened in Eritrea following a naval operation in the Red Sea. As a result, by the late spring of 1941, the Italian defence was collapsing on all fronts as the troops in East Africa found themselves effectively cut off from major reinforcement by Mussolini's government. Finally, on the 5th of May 1941, in an event which was stage-managed to occur exactly five years after Badoglio had arrived with his Italian forces to Addis Ababa, 
Selassie re-entered the capital of Ethiopia and proclaimed the liberation of the country from Italy. The restoration of the Solomonic dynasty and Emperor Haile Selassie to power in Ethiopia carried a proviso from the British who had largely restored the emperor to power. Slavery had to be banned entirely in Ethiopia. There had been piecemeal efforts at doing so as far back as the 1850s, at which time Britain was using its influence as the global superpower of the 19th century to try to curb the slave trade across Africa. These had intensified under Emperor Menelik II and during Selassie's time as regent back in the 1920s, but slavery had never fully been eradicated in Ethiopia and was still a feature of Ethiopian society when the Second Italo-Ethiopian War was initiated in 1935. Following the conquest, the Italians had declared the abolition of slavery a paradoxically humanitarian act for a state which elsewhere in Africa was engaging in genocide, and whose German ally would soon be using the slave labor of millions of Jews, Poles, Czechs, Russians, and other subject peoples across Central and Eastern Europe to drive its war economy. The British government made it clear to Selassie that this abolition needed to continue once he was restored to power and that he would have to take concerted steps to make a reality of that abolition. A decree was issued by the emperor to that effect in 1942, from which date we might say that slavery was finally abolished in Ethiopia. Though the East Africa campaign had resulted in a significant victory for the Allies in 1941, it took four more years for the Second World War to end in the defeat of Nazi Germany and its allies. When it did, the League of Nations was succeeded by the United Nations, which Ethiopia became a charter member of in 1948. Selassie had gained favorable consideration for his nation when it came to the settlement of East Africa in the aftermath of the conflict when the Ogaden region was granted to Ethiopia a region which had long been disputed by the Italians, British and Abyssinia prior to the war. Selassie's main concern during these years was to continue the modernization of his country. Considerable strides had been made in doing so in the 1920s and 1930s, but there were still deeply entrenched vested interests in the country within the nobility and the church, which were resistant to too much change occurring too rapidly. Selassie was determined to accelerate the pace of change as the war came to an end in the mid-1940s. Eventually, this would result in 1955 with a revised constitution, which moved beyond the Constitution of 1931 and incorporated elements of the U.S. Constitution. However, in practice, the election of parliamentary delegates remained in the hands of the nobility and other powerful bodies, and Ethiopia certainly did not become a Western-style democracy under Selassie's rule in the post-war years. Many controversial issues began to arise in Ethiopia in the post-war period, particularly so during the 1950s. One of these concerned one of the former Italian colonies, Eritrea. This small northern neighbor of Ethiopia's had been placed under British administration following the conclusion of the East Africa campaign in 1941. In the aftermath of the war, the Allied powers were in favor of Ethiopia's claims to Eritrea, though a small section of the west of the colony was to be joined to British Sudan. Accordingly, when British rule of Eritrea came to an end in the early 1950s, the country was joined with Ethiopia. But this was to be a federal union in which Eritrea retained its own identity and had certain devolved powers held in the hands of its own government. Selassie, though, was determined to bring Eritrea, which provided Ethiopia with access to the Red Sea, under greater centralized control. To this end, in 1962, he dissolved the independent Eritrean parliament and annexed the country. By that time, the Eritrean Liberation Front, or ELF, an independence movement, had launched an armed struggle against Ethiopian rule. The Eritrean War of Independence would continue for the next 30 years, with the conflict becoming a front in the Cold War as the ELF and other independence movements drifted into the Soviet bloc in order to acquire military aid from the USSR, Cuba and others. 
The Eritrean War of Independence was not the only conflict which Emperor Selassie's government faced. Ethnic tensions were also becoming more severe in the 1950s and 1960s. Ethiopia is a nation with approximately 80 different ethnic groups. The empire had effectively been formed through conquest over several centuries, and this had resulted in many ethnic groups remaining unreconciled to the dominance of Ethiopia, above all by the Oromo and Amhara peoples who made up over half of the country's population. Selassie himself was of Oromo descent. The solution, which was favored by Selassie and the Ethiopian government to this situation in the post-war period, was to foster the concept of ethnic federalism, whereby Ethiopia was divided into over a dozen major provinces in which different ethnicities predominated. However, rather than fixing the ethnic problem, this fueled it, ensuring that many Oromo, Amhara, Tigrayans, Somalis and others continued to shape their identity around their ethnicities rather than their shared identity as Ethiopians. This was already causing unrest in the country during Selassie's reign, but as we will see, this has been compounded in more recent times. Of all the ethnic peoples of Ethiopia, those who were most antagonistic to the government were the Tigrayans, who constituted a sizable proportion of the overall population, roughly 7 or 8 percent, and were the dominant people in Tigray province in the north of the country. The antipathy of Selassie's government towards the Tigrayans was clear for all to see in the 1950s, as the imperial government persistently neglected the province despite mounting evidence of pressure on its resources and the possibility of famine as a result of the destruction of crops by locusts, drought and disease, outbreaks of smallpox, typhus and other high mortality illnesses. When Tigray eventually did enter famine in 1958, the central government in Addis Ababa did very little to try to relieve the situation, leading to tens of thousands of deaths. Thereafter, a more concerted effort was made in 1959 to address the situation, with Selassie's government being provided with considerable aid from the administration of US President Dwight Eisenhower. Nevertheless, by the time the worst of the famine subsided in 1961, it is estimated that about 100,000 people had died in Tigray and surrounding regions, while renewed famine struck northern Ethiopia again in the mid-1960s. While Selassie's reign was increasingly being blackened by controversies at home, including famine in Tigray, a war of independence in Eritrea and ethnic tensions within Ethiopia, Selassie and, by extension, Ethiopia continued to hold a position of considerable international respect. As one of the world's longest-serving heads of state, he was usually afforded a position of considerable preeminence at major international events, such as the funeral of President John F. Kennedy in Washington, D.C. in 1963, and of the former French President Charles de Gaulle in France in 1970. Ethiopia also supplied peace contingents to many areas of conflict, such as the Congo in the early 1960s, and became a prominent nation within the non-aligned movement of nations which were not members of either NATO or the Warsaw Pact, the respective military alliances of the United States and the Soviet Union in the Cold War. Perhaps most significant of all in terms of international diplomacy at this time was Selassie's leading role in the establishment of the Organization of African Unity in 1963, the forerunner of the African Union. The headquarters of the Organization of African Unity was located in Addis Ababa for many years under Selassie's rule. Not only did Selassie continue to enjoy a vaunted reputation on the international stage in the second iteration of his reign after the Second World War, but he was viewed by many as a messianic character. In the 1930s, a new quasi-religion and social movement emerged in parts of Africa and the Caribbean, one which mixed elements of the Back to Africa movement, which proclaimed that people of African descent in the Americas would wish to return to the African continent now that slavery was at an end, and also Ethiopianism, a branch of Christian worship which had arisen in the late 19th century amongst African Christians, one which looked to the Ethiopian church as a native Christian church within Africa, rather than having African Christians take their directives from European religious leaders in Rome, Canterbury or elsewhere. 
This new movement combines specific belief in elements of biblical theology and a wide array of different social beliefs. It took its name from Selassie's regent title, dating from the 1920s, Rastafari. Thus, the new religion was known as Rastafarianism, and proponents of it viewed Selassie as a messiah, one who may be the second coming of Christ. These views must be understood in light of Ethiopia's position as the only African state which resisted colonial conquest in the 19th century. Selassie did not explicitly seek to be recognized as a messianic character within Rastafarianism, but he also did not attempt to refute efforts to exalt him in this way. Thus, as Rastafarianism gained in popularity in the 1950s in countries like Jamaica, Selassie took on an unusual significance for many people who had never been anywhere near Ethiopia. In contrast to the view of him within Rastafarianism as a quasi-messianic figure, Haile Selassie was actually becoming more oppressive at home in Ethiopia. The last 20 or so years of his reign saw the development of elements of a police state in the country. There were reasons for Selassie's increasing concern about the security of his position. In 1960, while the emperor was on a state visit to Brazil, elements from the Kebur Zabagna, the imperial bodyguard, had attempted a coup d'etat back in Ethiopia. Led by the brothers Germane and Mengustu Newe, the insurrectionists had proclaimed Selassie's son and heir, the crown prince Asfar Wassen, as the new emperor. The prince appears to have been held captive, but how complicit he might have been in the coup attempt remains unclear to this day. In any event, after four days of violence in and around Addis Ababa in mid-December, resulting in over 300 deaths, the attempted overthrow of the emperor had been suppressed and the leaders were killed. Nevertheless, the 1960 attempted coup was significant in the development of a more repressive authoritarian regime in Ethiopia under Selassie in the 1960s and into the 1970s. Hand in hand with the development of this more authoritarian streak in Ethiopian politics was a growing disdain for human rights in the country. In the 1960s, as student protest movements emerged and as communism gained favor in some circles, Selassie's regime dealt ever more frequently in mass arrests and the disappearance of political opponents. The press was widely censored, and intimidation of groups which questioned Selassie and the government was widespread by the 1960s. Compounding matters was the war in Eritrea, where the Imperial Ethiopian Army was engaging in civilian atrocities by the late 1960s. For instance, in December 1970, over 800 civilians were killed by Selassie's forces when they attacked the village of Ona. Moreover, at Hazimo in July 1967, over 170 men were killed by Ethiopian soldiers. Admittedly, some of these atrocities appear not to have been state-ordered, but the war in Eritrea was ultimately of Selassie's making. Unsurprisingly, by the early 1970s, despite the general positive view of Selassie internationally, civil rights groups such as Freedom House were declaring that Ethiopia was moving towards being a repressive authoritarian regime where human rights were being contravened. By the early 1970s, Selassie's rule and government was becoming increasingly unpopular among substantial sections of the population of Ethiopia. He still garnered support amongst traditional groups such as the church and the nobility, who had much to lose if the old imperial order was overthrown, but many others had no affinity for the ancient ruling dynasty. This disaffection was further compounded in 1972 by the onset of a new severe famine in Ethiopia. This time it was centered on Wolo province in the north of the country, near Tigray. This was brought on by drought and was compounded by an inadequate government response and a failure to import extra foodstuffs and deliver them to the affected areas. It is estimated that between 40,000 and 80,000 people died in Wolo and the adjoining regions in the course of 1972 and 1973, while the competition for resources exacerbated ethnic tensions here between groups such as the Oromos, Afars and Somalis. What was worse, news soon spread that, at the height of the famine, foodstuffs which were actually being successfully produced in Wallow were being exported out of the region to Addis Ababa and other parts of Ethiopia. 
Eventually, the unrest at Selassie's reign began to boil over. Perhaps this was unsurprising. In 1972, as famine was gripping Wallo, the emperor had turned 80 years of age. He had been in power, in one form or another, for over half a century, albeit as regent for the first 10 or so years and with a hiatus between 1936 and 1941. The first signs of disturbance arose in January 1974 when garrison soldiers in the town of Negeli Borana mutinied over a lack of clean drinking water and poor paying conditions. In a symbolic gesture, they detained one of their commanding officers, Lieutenant General Derese Dubale, and made show of him having to drink the water they were forced to consume. This resonated with many across Ethiopia, who were disgruntled at the rigid social structure which prevailed in the country and the perception of there being an elite of individuals who were connected to Selassie's regime. In early February, as news of the mutiny spread, protests and insurrectionary movements developed across the country. Crucially, many elements within the military and the police services joined the disturbances. This augured ill for Selassie, whose grip on power, like any authoritarian ruler, could only be maintained so long as the military and security forces remained loyal. By early March, Selassie was under sufficient pressure that he made a number of announcements that political concessions would be made to make ministers and senior government officials more accountable to the parliament. Moreover, the 1955 constitution would be re-evaluated to see how Ethiopia's politics could be made more inclusive of different groups within the empire. Yet, these compromises failed to stem the tide of unrest. Instead, labor unions called for general strike action across the country in March 1974, and early in April, the significant Muslim minority in the country began agitating for greater religious freedoms. By that time, elements of the military were evidently in charge of much of the running of the government, and Selassie was losing control of the situation. However, it was not until June that the infamous Dirk was set up. This was officially known as the Provisional Military Administrative Council and consisted of relatively low-ranking army officers and officials who effectively seized power in the summer of 1974. That summer, they began a campaign of arrests of prominent political figures and issued a manifesto of proposed reforms. Finally, on the 12th of September 1974, 44 years after he first became emperor and nearly six decades since his accession to a position of preeminence in Ethiopian politics, the Derg deposed Emperor Haile Selassie. Following his deposition, Selassie was placed under house arrest. His son, Crown Prince Asfar Wassen, who had been proclaimed as emperor by the leaders of the failed coup of 1960, was now again proclaimed by the Derg. He was not in Ethiopia at the time and decreed that his father's deposition and the actions of the Provisional Military Administrative Council in proclaiming him as emperor were illegitimate. Accordingly, in March 1975, the Derg abolished the Ethiopian monarchy altogether, bringing the empire to an end and ushering in the creation of a new Ethiopian state. Meanwhile, the new military junta had spent much of the winter of 1974 and the spring of 1975 overseeing the execution of hundreds of those who were associated with the old imperial regime. This included some collateral members of the imperial family, notably Iskander Desta, a grandson of Selassie's, who had also been a prominent figure within the Ethiopian navy. The signs for the former emperor were ominous, and several months later, on the 28th of August 1975, state media announced that Selassie had died the previous day, the 27th of August. The official cause of death at 83 years of age was given as respiratory failure, but Selassie had almost certainly been strangled to death by Derg soldiers. His remains were interred under a concrete slab in the grounds of the Imperial Palace in Addis Ababa. They were only finally removed in 1992 and placed in Holy Trinity Cathedral in Addis Ababa, near those of his auspicious predecessor, Emperor Menelik II. By the time Selassie was killed, Ethiopia had descended into a long civil war from which it would not emerge until the early 1990s. The Derg established Ethiopia as a Soviet-aligned country, espousing Marxist-Leninist principles in the mid-1970s. 
It was opposed by rival revolutionary groups such as the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Party and the Tigray People's Liberation Front. Compounding matters was the ongoing War of Independence in Eritrea, and from 1977 onwards, a further regional conflict as Ethiopia found itself at war with Somalia over possession of the province of Ogaden. In this morass of political conflicts, political violence amplified across the country, with tens of thousands being killed in the Red Terror unleashed by the Derg regime in the second half of the 1970s. By the 1980s, the Ethiopian civil war was made even more traumatic by the arrival of new famines, the biggest wave coming between 1983 and 1985, in which upwards of half a million people perished. The fighting only eventually came to a conclusion in 1991, once the collapse of the Soviet Union ended the flow of weaponry into the Horn of Africa. By the time it ended, nearly one and a half million people had died from the combined effects of military conflict, disease, and famine. The end of the Ethiopian civil war in 1991 brought about a brief respite from the country's woes. A new constitution was established in the mid-1990s, while Eritrea finally gained its independence after three decades of fighting. There were then efforts to create an ethno-territorial federal state, where different ethnic groups had control over different provinces of the country where they were dominant. However, renewed problems soon arose. A new war erupted with Eritrea in 1998. The initial fighting ceased in 2000, but border tensions and intermittent conflict have remained a perennial problem in northern Ethiopia. Internally, Ethiopia's efforts to resolve its ethnic tensions by creating a federal state have largely failed. In particular, the government's antagonism towards the Tigray minority in northern Ethiopia which is a deep-rooted legacy of Selassie's time as emperor, has come to international attention in recent years. In 2020, the Ethiopian federal government effectively initiated a war against Tigray, one which is ongoing as of late 2022, and which has resulted in war crimes, mass famine, and behavior by the government which many international observers see as genocidal. Thus, while Ethiopia is viewed as having the potential to become a major economic and political power in East Africa, as Africa experiences considerable economic expansion in the 21st century, the structural problems of the country, which were not only left unresolved by Selassie, but exacerbated, remain a grave problem in the Horn of Africa. Emperor Haile Selassie was a paradoxical character in 20th century history. On the one hand, in the first half of his reign, he made major advances in modernizing Ethiopia even before he became emperor himself, while in the 1930s he emerged as a figurehead in opposition to the rise of fascism and brutality as the Italians invaded and conquered his nation. This reputation as a leading statesman was cemented in the aftermath of the Second World War when he forged an independent stance on the world stage and was also well regarded for his suppression of slavery in Ethiopia. Overlying all of this is the most unusual position which he has acquired as a messianic character within Rastafarianism. However, Selassie also had many things which stand against him. His reign became increasingly autocratic in his later years, and there were manifold human rights abuses committed at home in Ethiopia between the 1950s and 1970s. Eventually, these resulted in revolution and his overthrow. Additionally, his handling of Eritrea's position resulted in a war which persisted for 30 years and after Selassie's own time. However, perhaps Selassie's greatest crime was in failing to reconcile the ethnic and religious differences of his nation during his long reign as both regent and emperor, which lasted over half a century. This failure has cast a long shadow over modern Ethiopia and continues to create problems in the Horn of Africa today. What do you think of Emperor Haile Selassie? Do you think his deposition by the Italians in the 1930s created undue sympathy for him, which has caused popular opinion to overlook his own crimes? Please let us know in the comments section, and in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.
The man known to history as Nelson Mandela was born on the 18th of July 1918 in the village of Mvezo in the Cape Province, the southernmost province of what was then the Union of South Africa. His given name at birth was Rolihlahla Mandela, Rolihlahla meaning something akin to troublemaker or pulling the branch of a tree. Nelson's father was Gadler Henry Mandela, a local chief of the Oza people and counselor to the Oza king of Abatembu at a time when the native Bantu people still maintained many of their own traditional structures of authority even while existing within the Union of South Africa politically. Gadla's grandfather, Nubenkuka, was the king of the kingdom of Abu Tembu. Consequently, Nelson was descended from native royalty and was theoretically a prince. Gadla Mandela, in keeping with the customs of South Africa at the time, was a polygamist and had four wives. Roli Hlatla was the son of his third wife, Nosekeni Fani. Given his father's marital relations, he had many siblings and half-siblings, some of whom lived in different households and even in different villages. Roli Hlatla's early life was lived between two worlds. On the one hand, his father lived much like many local chiefs had in the region for centuries, also serving as a counsellor to the Abatembu king between the mid-1910s and the mid-1920s as Roli Hlatla was growing up. But the country was also modernising and the traditional Bantu peoples such as the Oza and Zulus were beginning to adopt Western social customs. Roli Hlatla's early years reflected this. On the one hand, he grew up according to Oza tradition in his mother's kraal or homestead, tending their herd. However, Western influences were to be seen, such as the fact that his mother had converted to Christianity and decided to send her son to a local Methodist missionary school. It was here that he was given the name Nelson on his first day of education, one which he has become known to the world by. Mandela, whose parents were both illiterate, was the first member of his family to attend school. When he was nine years old, his father died from a lung ailment, at which time he was taken largely under the wing of the Khosa Royal Court, though he continued to attend school, developing a love of history and also adopting his mother's Christian beliefs. In these early days, his view of colonial rule was that it was broadly beneficial in introducing major social and economic development into Southern Africa. The country Mandela came of age in had been fashioned over a period of 300 years, since the mid-17th century. Prior to this time, there was no nation of South Africa. Rather, the mass of land at the southern point of the African continent was a broad tapestry of kingdoms ruled by different tribes such as the Zulu, Hosa and Swazi peoples, many of them deriving from the broad Bantu ethnic group. These kingdoms had contact with the Arab and Indian world through their trade with Great Zimbabwe and other cultures to the north, but it was not until the late 15th century that they first encountered Europeans when the Portuguese reached the Cape of Good Hope. Supply stations were established here in due course by the Portuguese, but it was not until 1652 when the Dutch established the Cape Colony where Cape Town lies today that a permanent European settler colony was established here. This expanded over the next century and a half, but in the early 19th century, the Dutch colony was occupied and taken over by Britain during the Napoleonic Wars. The British Cape Colony began aggressively expanding in the second half of the 19th century, moving its borders north and northeast to cover much of the region approximating to modern-day South Africa an expansion that was fueled by the discovery of gold and diamonds. Conflicts ensued with both the native Zulus and the Boers, the descendants of the Dutch, German and French settlers who had made Southern Africa their home in the 17th and 18th centuries, resisting British colonial expansion. However, with the victory in the Second Boer War in 1902, the British had come to control the entire region. In 1910, it was formed into the Union of South Africa. The Union was quasi-independent of Britain, but still tied to it in many significant ways, notably in its foreign policy and the retention of the British monarchy as the head of state. It was a troubled country from its birth. The overwhelming majority of the population were black Africans, 
but the ruling class was a minority of people descended from European settlers, primarily the Dutch, German and French Boers, and to a lesser extent, the British. These monopolized the extensive wealth of the country and political power and had already shown tendencies towards creating a colonial underclass by retaining settlers from the British Raj in India as indentured servants. There were tens of thousands of such indentured servants here by the early 20th century. The Boers even began to develop their own national identity in South Africa, conceiving of themselves as Afrikaners and speaking Afrikaans, a Dutch West German dialect which had evolved amongst the settlers in South Africa since the 17th century. These Afrikaners were determined to cling on to power in South Africa, despite only constituting about 20% of the country's population. Their efforts to monopolize political power, wealth and control of South Africa would define the country's history in the 20th century and Nelson Mandela's life. When he was 16 years old, Nelson was officially declared to be a man after undergoing the traditional Ulwaluko circumcision ritual which was standard amongst the Xhosa. By that time, he had already commenced his secondary education with a view to becoming a counselor to the Xhosa monarchy, like his father before him. His belief being that the Xhosa kingdom would need educated officials to survive in a changing world. To that end, he attended Clarkbury Methodist High School from 1933 onwards, and then the Methodist College in Healdtown in Fort Beaufort in the Cape Province. Thereafter, he began studying for a bachelor's degree at the University of Fort Hare in Alice in the Eastern Cape, a leading third-level institution for black Africans, not just from South Africa, but wider afield in the British colonies north in Rhodesia and the rest of sub-Saharan Africa. Here, Mandela studied law, politics and history, while he was also a notable long-distance runner and boxer during his student days. In 1939, as the Second World War broke out in Europe, Mandela began attending Fort Hare. At this time, he supported South Africa's involvement as a British colony, an indication that even in his early 20s, Mandela still viewed colonial rule positively. Mandela had lived a relatively isolated life up to this point, largely confined to his experiences of traditional Xhosa society and Fort Hare in the East Cape. All that would change in the 1940s. At the start of the decade, a prominent chief of Abba Tembu, Jonging Taba, set up an arranged marriage for Mandela. Nelson wished to avoid this, and so he fled to the city of Johannesburg in the spring of 1941, before eventually relocating to George Gotch Township. Here he met and befriended Walter Sisulu, a prominent activist in the African National Congress, or ANC. This had been founded back in 1912 as the South African National Native Congress to agitate for the rights of black South Africans within the Union of South Africa. It was renamed as the African National Congress in 1923. The party was primarily comprised of well-educated black Africans who lived in the major towns of the Union, many of whom were Christians. However, it also enjoyed considerable, though unofficial, support from native power groups such as the Xhosa. Mandela was impressed by the political views of Sisulu and others, a large number of whom were left-wing activists, and by 1943 he had become a member of the ANC. Just months later, at Easter 1944, he was central to the establishment of the ANC Youth League, after convincing the ANC president at the time, Alfred Bitimi Mouma, that if their struggle was to be successful, they would need to gain mass support from the younger generations of South Africans. It was also around this time, in early 1944, that Mandela married his first wife, Evelyn Masse, a trainee nurse whom he had met at a gathering at Walter Sisulu's house, Evelyn being a close friend of Sisulu's partner, Albertina. Mandela and Evelyn started dating within days of first meeting and were soon engaged. They married in a civil ceremony at the Johannesburg Crown Commissioner's Court on the 5th of October 1944. The wedding was a muted affair, as the couple could not afford a wedding feast on Evelyn's salary as a trainee nurse, and the income from Mandela's various jobs in law clerks' offices. For a time, they lived in a room in Evelyn's sister Kate's home, 
their own first home in the Johannesburg township of Soweto, which they moved into in 1946, was also a very modest affair, being a small brick building with a cement floor and a galvanized tin roof. Together they would eventually have four children, a son, Tembikele, born in 1946, a daughter, Makaziwe, born in 1947, and who unfortunately died of meningitis in infancy, another son named Mac Gatto, born in 1950, and another daughter in 1954, whom they named Makaziwe in honor of their first daughter, who had died so prematurely. As Mandela and Evelyn were starting their family, the ANC's struggle for the rights of black South Africans was becoming an even more bitter battle. The war years had seen many black Africans migrating to the cities and towns of South Africa and increasing their agitation for political representation and economic equality through movements like the ANC. This perturbed many amongst the Boer-descended white minority who wanted to retain control of South Africa politically, socially and economically. This political view prevailed in the 1948 national elections, which only whites were eligible to vote in. In this, the Herenigte Nationale Party, led by D. F. Malen, which was a staunchly anti-black, right-wing party, considerably increased its vote share and allied with the similarly right-wing Afrikaner Party to outflank the more moderate United Party of Jan Smuts, which had been in power since the mid-1930s. Malen became Prime Minister in 1948 and the HNP and Afrikaner Party would unite in 1951 into the National Party. It would dominate South Africa's politics for the next four decades. More immediately, in 1948, Malen began overseeing the introduction of the policy of apartheid, meaning apartness or separateness in Afrikaans. This aimed to create a two-tier society in South Africa, one in which the white minority would continue to monopolize political, economic and social power, and society would be segregated so that whites and blacks would live in completely different neighborhoods, use different restaurants, swimming pools, public transport, and public toilets, while also introducing legislation which limited the civil liberties of the black majority. To a considerable extent, it mirrored the policy of segregation which had been developed in the southern states in the USA following the failure of Reconstruction in the aftermath of the American Civil War. Even before the introduction of apartheid in 1948, Mandela was already increasing his involvement in South Africa's politics. In 1947, he was elected to the Executive Committee of the ANC in the Transvaal province in the northeast of South Africa. Following the election of 1948, he was involved with Sisulu and others in effectively overthrowing Alfred Bettini Uma as president of the ANC, Uma being regarded as too conservative. He was succeeded by James Moroka, with Susulu serving as the new Secretary General of the ANC. A more militant approach was now adopted in light of recent political developments at home in South Africa and the emergence of black nationalist movements all over the African continent following the Second World War. Mandela also emerged as a considerable figure in the party, becoming a member of the party's National Executive Committee in 1950. The early to mid-1950s also saw Mandela increasingly embracing communist thought. He had first encountered South African communism in the early 1940s, and while he had been impressed by its desire for racial equality, he was unhappy with the movement's anti-religious stance, which did not fit well with Mandela's Christian beliefs. However, as his political views became more militant in the early 1950s, and the policy of apartheid spread across South Africa, Mandela began reconsidering his approach to the communist movement. In reading the works of Marx and Lenin at this time, he found their thoughts of a classless society, where all were economic equals, appealing. Moreover, the introduction of the Suppression of Communism Act in 1950 by the apartheid regime had the effect of drawing many black South African militants to the South African Communist Party in the 1950s. In 1952, Mandela spoke at several ANC rallies, which attracted thousands of supporters, in the process becoming one of the most notable figures in the movement. He was duly appointed as president of the ANC in the Transvaal region that year. Meanwhile, 
he continued to work for several law firms, eventually passing the exams to practice as an attorney in 1953 and opening his own law firm in Johannesburg shortly afterwards. He would spend much of the mid-1950s representing black South Africans who were being persecuted by the apartheid government. The mid-1950s were a period of considerable change in South Africa. The apartheid government stepped up its efforts to relocate tens of thousands of black South Africans from parts of certain cities and towns with the goal of creating monolithically white neighborhoods. This was aided from a legal and logistical point of view by the passage of the Natives Resettlement Act of 1954. With this, prominent ANC leaders such as Sisulu and Mandela came to the conclusion that black South Africans would only be able to redress the institutionalized inequality and oppression which pervaded society through militant, violent action. Consequently, in 1955, it issued the Freedom Charter, which called for a non-racial society of equals in South Africa. At the same time, the ANC began acquiring weapons from other powers. Inevitably, in the context of the Cold War, given that the apartheid regime was an ally of the Western powers, these came from the Communist bloc and the People's Republic of China in particular. At the same time, Mandela's first marriage to Evelyn broke down in the mid-1950s. She accused him of physical abuse and left with their children in 1956, following which divorce proceedings were initiated. Mandela denied the charges and filed for custody of their children, though it appears clear that he was unfaithful in his marriage. Eventually, the divorce was finalized by 1958, quickly after which Nelson married Winnie Madikezela, whom he had met and begun dating the previous year. They would have two daughters together, Zinani and Zindiswa, born in 1959 and 1960. Winnie would play a major role in Nelson's life and South African politics for decades to come. Mandela's second marriage and his meeting Winnie very nearly never happened at all. In December 1956, he and several other senior members of the ANC had been arrested by the South African government and were accused of high treason on the grounds that they were inciting revolution against the government. However, after mass protests, they were eventually bailed early in 1957. The prosecution of 156 individuals, including Mandela, which has become known in South African history as the treason trial, would drag on throughout the late 1950s and into the early 1960s. As it did, the number of defendants continued to decline and the charges were watered down, as dozens of defendants were acquitted over time and the government realized its case was extremely weak. It would eventually end in 1961 with the acquittal of all defendants. In the meantime, Mandela and his colleagues were free to continue their activities. This period was notable for Mandela's opposition to the newly formed Pan-African Congress, a new South African political movement which was exclusionary of non-black South Africans. Mandela was already convinced by this time that any future South Africa, which would include liberties for the black majority, would also have to be tolerant and inclusive of the white minority and the significant community of people of Indian heritage in the country. The end of the treason trial instilled in the South African government a fresh desire to bring the leaders of the ANC to court. Years of persecution had also given Mandela a keen sense of how important it was to carry out his work in a secretive manner. Thus, in the early 1960s, he spent much of his time traveling around South Africa incognito establishing new cells of the ANC in different towns and villages. The goal was to expand the ANC's network and sphere of activity so that it had a truly national presence throughout South Africa, with supporters in every region should a militant insurrection be launched against the apartheid government. Mandela's preferred mode of transport in carrying out this activity was nondescript cars, which he pretended to be a driver for hire of. This consequently earned him the nickname The Black Pimpernel, a reference to The Scarlet Pimpernel, a novel published in 1905 by Baroness Emma Orzi, in which an English gentleman, Sir Percy Blakeney, leads a double life during the French Revolution, traveling around to try to save the country's aristocrats from the revolutionaries. 
Mandela's activities, though, were not unnoticed, and shortly after the treason trial ended, a new warrant for his arrest was issued by the government. The increasingly militant actions of the ANC in the late 1950s and early 1960s must be viewed in the international context. A wave of independence movements had spread across Africa in the post-war period, and this soon resulted in Britain, France, Belgium and Italy granting independence to their former colonies across the continent, beginning with Ghana in 1957. However, there was considerable resistance to independence in some parts of Africa, notably the southern end of the continent in the Portuguese colonies of Angola and Mozambique, and the British colonies such as Rhodesia around what is now Zimbabwe. By the early 1960s, armed militant movements began to emerge amongst the native African people in these regions. While South Africa had a different constitutional status, having acquired independence from Britain gradually from the early 20th century onwards, the struggle against apartheid in the country was viewed as a quasi-colonial struggle for the black majority to acquire political representation and an end to their social and economic disenfranchisement. Thus, from the early 1960s, the ANC had growing connections to groups such as the Zimbabwe African People's Union, the Zimbabwe African National Union, the Liberation Front of Mozambique, and the People's Movement for the Liberation of Angola, while successive national party governments in South Africa supported the Portuguese government and the Rhodesian government after it became independent from Britain, against the liberation movements in Angola, Mozambique, and Rhodesia. It was in this context that Mandela headed to Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, to attend the Pan-African Meeting for East, Central and Southern Africa in the city in the spring of 1962. This was just the first leg of a wider tour of Africa, which brought Mandela to Tanganyika, Egypt, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, Mali, Guinea, Liberia, Senegal and Sierra Leone. Meeting leaders of these newly independent nations, such as President Gamal Nasser of Egypt, President William Tubman of Liberia, President Ahmed Sekou Toure of Guinea, and President Julius Nerere of Tanganyika. Through these summits, he was able to acquire extensive funding for the ANC, and in some cases, promises of arms and ammunition for any future revolutionary struggle in South Africa. Nor was this the only success of the ANC on the international stage during these years. The organization's president, Albert Lutuli, had brought the injustice of apartheid onto the international stage, and in the summer of 1959, the anti-apartheid movement was established in London, attracting considerable support from members of the main political parties in Britain and international leaders. It was just one of many anti-apartheid movements which were established over the next 30 years, which would place increasing political and economic pressure on successive national party administrations in South Africa to bring apartheid to an end. While all of this was occurring, a split was growing within the ANC. The party's president, Lutuli, was largely committed to non-violent opposition to the government of the kind pioneered by Mahatma Gandhi in India decades earlier. However, Mandela, Sisulu and others within the ANC had concluded by the early 1960s that the position of black South Africans in the country would only improve if they engaged in an armed struggle. Accordingly, in the summer of 1961, they established Mkonto Wesizwe, meaning Spear of the Nation, as a paramilitary wing of the ANC. Mandela, Sisulu, Joe Slovo, Raymond Plaba, and Wilton Mkwayi were the first overall commanders of the organization, which began armed attacks on South African government targets from December 1961 onwards. By this time, Mandela was effectively the leader of Umkonto Wesizwe, which not only began a bombing campaign, but was also planning for a more sustained guerrilla war, like the one which had been started in Angola earlier that year and which would soon follow in Rhodesia and Mozambique. Mandela's tour of Africa in the first months of 1962 was undertaken with the aim of acquiring the resources necessary to begin such a guerrilla war in South Africa, where the wealthy white minority, supported by many Western governments, had modern weaponry and extensive resources at its disposal in the event of such a war. 
The war which Mandela and his associates were planning in the early 1960s was stopped in its tracks in 1962. On the 5th of August that year, Mandela was arrested in northeastern South Africa, his arrest aided by the American CIA, who feared that Mkonto Wesizwe and the ANC would pull South Africa into the Soviet communist camp in the Cold War if they succeeded in their aims. This was the most significant in a series of arrests of leading members of Mkonto Wesizwe, the ANC and the South African Communist Party, such as Walter Sisulu, Lionel Bernstein and Govan Mbeki, which occurred in 1962 and 1963. They were soon placed on trial in what became known as the Rivonia Trial, named for the Johannesburg suburb which Mkonto Wesizwe was based out of. Mandela was listed as accused number one in the indictment and Sisulu as accused number two. The trial ran for eight months between October 1963 and June 1964, with Mandela and his co-accused facing a series of charges including sabotage, fomenting guerrilla warfare, furthering the objectives of communism and conspiring with foreign governments to undermine the government of South Africa. During the trial, Mandela and several others admitted they had engaged in some of the actions they were accused of and used the trial to promote their political beliefs. On the 20th of April 1964, Mandela gave arguably his most famous political speech from the dock. I have fought against white domination and I have fought against black domination. I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons will live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to see realized, but if it needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. In the end, it was not a cause which Mandela would die for, but it was a cause for which he was sentenced to life imprisonment when the trial ended in June 1964, narrowly escaping the death penalty which the prosecution had called for. Mandela and his co-accused, such as Sisulu, were transferred from Pretoria, where they had been held while their trial was underway, to Robben Island. This small oval-shaped island, measuring just over three kilometers by two kilometers, lying in Table Bay, not far from Cape Town, had been used at various points in the past as a leper colony, a whaling station, and a military base during the Second World War. In 1961, the National Party government had begun developing it into a maximum security prison to house political prisoners whom they feared might be broken out of prison on the South African mainland. Mandela and his fellow members of the ANC and other revolutionary movements would spend the next 20 years here in crude concrete cells which measured 8 foot by 7 foot with no furniture of any real kind other than a straw mat to sleep on and a small table. During the day, prisoners were made to work in quarries and to undertake back-breaking physical labor without medical care of any major kind. Over the next several years, Mandela's eyesight was permanently damaged from working long hours outside without eye protection of any kind. Visits were heavily restricted for the prisoners as was access to all political news from the outside world. While Mandela and his associates may have been largely shut off from the outside world, the struggle against apartheid in South Africa continued throughout the 1960s and 1970s. Although the ANC had been robbed of much of its leadership, it remained central to the opposition to the National Party, which from 1966 to 1978 was headed by John Forster as Prime Minister, an Afrikaner nationalist of Boer heritage who as Minister for Justice had overseen the Rivonia trial in 1963 and 1964. Under Forster's leadership, the South African government increased its apartheid policies and began spending enormous sums of money on military spending to enforce its laws and prevent an uprising. During this period, non-white political representation of any kind was terminated across South Africa. Political violence continued, most notably the Soweto uprising of June 1976, when approximately 20,000 students protested against the government in Soweto a major suburb of Johannesburg. The government crackdown was brutal, with at least 170 deaths and perhaps as many as 700. Hundreds more were badly injured. These and other atrocities perpetrated by the ruling National Party 
continued to make South Africa a pariah for many on the international stage. One which was refused entry into the British Commonwealth in 1961, was condemned by the United Nations in 1966, and faced opposition from many public civil organizations globally throughout these years. Back on Robben Island, conditions for Mandela and the others who had been convicted in 1964 were improving by the end of the decade, in large part because the ANC had successfully made their detention a subject of international interest. As a result, Mandela was visited by numerous high-ranking political figures from the late 1960s onwards, notably the British Defence Minister Dennis Healy. But in other ways, their treatment remained harsh. When Mandela's mother and his son Tembi died in 1968 and 1969, he was refused leave to attend either funeral, while his second wife Winnie, who had become a senior figure herself within the ANC, faced constant harassment throughout his time on Robben Island, often being detained herself for lengthy periods of time. Mandela used this time to continue his legal studies, while he also organized several hunger strikes to protest at the treatment of him and his fellow political prisoners. Beyond this, he devoted much of his time to reading, while his behavior was generally sanguine enough that in 1975 he was classed as a Class A prisoner, who was allowed increased visits and correspondence with the outside world. By the late 1970s, a campaign was underway both within South Africa and internationally to have those who had been imprisoned back in 1964 following the Rivonia trial released from incarceration. Mandela became the figurehead of this drive for several reasons. Firstly, he was a figure whose stated views on South African politics had remained consistent since he first became a public figure, and he could not be accused of being anti-white, but simply anti-apartheid. Moreover, his wife Winnie had a public profile herself and was able to act as his spokesperson. The ANC also deliberately pursued a policy of making Mandela the central figure in their movement in the 1970s and 1980s, with Free Mandela becoming a synonym for ending apartheid in South Africa. The South African government was concerned by all of this, and in 1982 made the decision to transfer Mandela, Sisulu and several others from Robben Island to Polesmore Prison in the suburbs of Cape Town. They were able to present this to the international world as an easing of the terms of Mandela's sentence, but in reality the move was designed to prevent the elder ANC members from further radicalizing young detainees on Robben Island. The conditions here were no better than on Robben Island, and in some ways worse. Mandela would later describe Pauls Moore as, quote, the truth of Oscar Wilde's haunting line about the tent of blue that prisoners call the sky, a reference to the Irish poet's Ballad of Reading Jail. Mandela would remain at Pauls Moore prison for over six years. During that time, South Africa's politics entered a period of crises which would combine to bring about the end of apartheid. Firstly, the South African economy was badly hit in the early 1980s by the economic downturn which had hit the Western world since 1973. As South Africans lost their jobs, they became more restless and agitated for greater political change, a common precursor to political revolutions. Secondly, 1983 saw the foundation of the United Democratic Front in South Africa, an organization which became an umbrella group for trade unions, South Africa's churches, students and other civil society organizations to protest against apartheid. Over the next several years, its membership swelled to several million South Africans, creating a broad organization in opposition to the National Party and apartheid supporters. Finally, on the international stage, the Cold War began drifting inexorably to a conclusion from the mid-1980s, following Mikhail Gorbachev's assumption of the leadership of the Soviet Union. As this occurred, countries like the United States and Britain, which had been steadfast supporters of the South African government as a bulwark against communism in Southern Africa, became increasingly critical of the regime. By the mid-1980s, these events had begun to exert immense pressure on the government of Peter Willembota, the leader of the National Party and consecutively the Prime Minister of South Africa from 1978 to 1984 and then President of the country from 1984 to 1989. 
In particular, social unrest within South Africa and the economic damage that was being inflicted on the country by international trade boycotts, owing to the white minority's continuing adherence to apartheid, were major issues which Bota and his ministers could not ignore. Accordingly, as early as 1985, talks were underway between the government and Mandela and other ANC leaders about how to transition to a more democratic country where black South Africans would be fully enfranchised. Earlier constitutional reforms in 1983 to create a tricameral parliament, one wherein blacks, Indians and other non-whites would each have a say of some kind, having been viewed as simply a smokescreen. These talks moved slowly from 1985 onwards, with Bota only willing to countenance a slow transition to a broad democracy in South Africa. But as the international situation changed in the late 1980s and the pressure on the apartheid government rapidly increased, it became evident that Bota's position was untenable. He resigned in August 1989 and was replaced by the individual who, alongside Mandela, would be most responsible for dismantling apartheid in South Africa. F. W. de Klerk, a member of a prominent Afrikaner family who had been a member of the House of Assembly for the National Party since 1972 and who had garnered a reputation as a firm supporter of apartheid. However, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, he would dramatically shift course in order to avoid plunging South Africa into a racial civil war. By the time de Klerk became president of South Africa in the autumn of 1989, Mandela had been moved from Polsmoor prison to Victor Ferster prison near the city of Parle in the Western Cape. He had developed tuberculosis in 1988 while at Polsmoor from the damp there and was moved to Victor Ferster to recover. Within weeks, de Klerk was debating with his cabinet about legalizing the ANC and releasing Mandela from prison moves which he believed could not be prevented once the Berlin Wall fell in Germany in November 1989 and the Western rationale for supporting the apartheid government began to crumble, along with the wall in Germany. Thus, in December 1989, de Klerk met with Mandela and indicated that he was to be released from prison after a quarter of a century in detention. In a surprise move, though, Mandela requested that this be delayed as he needed to liaise with the other heads of the ANC and to prepare for his release. Consequently, it was not until the 11th of February 1990 that Mandela finally walked out of Victor Ferster prison as a free man. The images of him walking out, holding his wife Winnie's hand in the air, are some of the most iconic of the politics of the late 20th century. While Mandela was released early in 1990 and there were concerted efforts underway to bring apartheid to an end, this was a long and complicated process. A society which had been divided in such a way for over 40 years could not be radically overhauled in just a few weeks. First, the ban on the ANC was lifted and this allowed for bilateral talks between the party and de Klerk's government. Concerted negotiations were undertaken at the Convention for a Democratic South Africa, held in the Johannesburg Trade Center in December 1991. Here, the remaining divisions between both sides were clearly on display, with the cleric asserting that the ANC had effectively been a terrorist organization and Mandela denouncing apartheid rule in his speech. On top of this, both figures had to contend with hardliners within their respective parties, who did not want to accommodate the other side. Talks through 1992 focused on whether a federal South Africa should be established, which would grant significant autonomy to individual regions. This would allow the white Africana community to retain significant control over the Cape Province and other regions where they were largely concentrated. De Klerk also mooted the idea of a rotating presidency with white South Africans assured of terms in office. These major points of contention aside, by the end of 1993, both sides, led by de Klerk and Mandela, had managed to agree on the holding of elections in the spring of 1994, the first of which would involve a wide franchise in which black South Africans and other non-white communities would have an equal vote with the Africana community. On the back of this, Mandela and de Klerk were jointly awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1993 for their collective work in bringing apartheid to an end.
It was during the early 1990s as well that Mandela finally managed to publish his well-known autobiography entitled Long Walk to Freedom. Mandela had begun writing this while imprisoned on Robben Island in the 1970s, but efforts to smuggle the text out of prison and have it published in London had failed, and at various times pages of it had been found by guards and confiscated. Now, most likely with the aid of a ghostwriter, he published it in 1994. The book provided an extensive account of his youth and early years, before delving into his political career and beliefs in the second part. Yet it was also a product of its time, and Mandela either toned down certain sections or emphasized others in line with the political needs of the transition away from apartheid. For instance, Almost nothing is said of de Klerk's complicity in some of the more violent actions of the National Party government in the 1970s and 1980s, while many aspects of the terror campaign engaged in by the ANC, much of which involved Mandela's second wife Winnie, were obfuscated. These issues aside, the book went on to become a bestseller and is a striking statement of one man's adversity over a period of nearly 30 years in various prisons. The first free and fair elections in South Africa's history were held between the 26th and 29th of April 1994. Nearly 20 million votes were cast, a huge proportion of the eligible electorate in what was then a country of 43 million people. Mandela stood for election as president as head of the ANC and won a clear majority, with 62% of votes cast, while de Klerk and the National Party won just over 20%. The continuing divisions within South African society were seen in the fact that the Inkata Freedom Party, a right-wing black South African party, which did not want reconciliation with the Afrikaner community, received over 10% of the vote, while the Freedom Front, a right-wing Afrikaner party, whose core goal would become the establishment of an independent Cape Colony, dominated by white South Africans, also received hundreds of thousands of votes. While this pointed towards the fact that there was still much to be done to effect national reconciliation, the election brought Mandela and the ANC to power. He was sworn into office in Pretoria on the 10th of May 1994. He would head up a government of national unity which included seats in the cabinet for members of any party which obtained more than 20 seats in the parliament, as had been agreed by the ANC and the National Party prior to the elections. Thus, de Klerk, along with Thabo Mbeki, the deputy president of the ANC, became deputy presidents of South Africa. There were many problems facing South Africa upon Mandela's entry into the presidential office in the early summer of 1994. While apartheid had come to an end, South African society was still bitterly divided. Perhaps more significantly, the economic state of the country was not good. Most of the wealth was concentrated in the hands of the white minority, with most black South Africans entrenched in poverty. There was also a dire need for investment in schools, hospitals and other social services countrywide, while large sections of the country did not have access to electricity or clean water. Crime was also pervasive. To compound matters, many white Afrikaners were leaving the country, fearing that they would have their wealth stripped from them by state policies in the new South Africa. This resulted in a wealth drain and a brain drain as the white community was better educated than the black majority owing to the educational inequality which had prevailed during apartheid. Finally, South Africa's international trade was in a dismal state following years of international boycotts of South African exports in protest at apartheid. The problem was added to for Mandela, as the ANC had campaigned on a platform of significantly improving the economic and social circumstances of black South Africans. Yet, it was not at all clear how this would be achieved. Mandela perceived his primary role as president to oversee the transition to a new post-apartheid South Africa and to effect national reconciliation. There was no guarantee in 1994 that the country would not descend into racial violence. Mandela aimed to avoid this by appealing to South Africans of all backgrounds to forge a new rainbow nation, a term devised by the Archbishop of Cape Town, Desmond Tutu, to describe a new multiracial country. Mandela led the way in doing so 
He was openly respectful of the history and culture of the white Africana population and tried to cultivate ties with former enemies. He spoke often of peace and reconciliation, though it was not always easy. His relationship, for instance, with the cleric in the unity government was strained, the National Party leader finding it difficult to perform the role of the junior partner in government after nearly half a century of uninterrupted National Party rule. A major symbolic event in this wide process of national reconciliation was the Rugby World Cup of 1995, which was hosted by South Africa. Rugby was generally seen as a white sport in South Africa, but Mandela urged black South Africans to support the team in the event. It was a symbolic moment in the forging of the new nation, when Mandela presented the trophy to the victorious South African team when they defeated New Zealand in the final. More broadly, while national reconciliation was not an absolute triumph, with many Afrikaners leaving South Africa and racial tensions persisting in many cities and communities, Mandela was successful in it insofar as major racial violence was avoided in post-apartheid South Africa. Mandela's government had a mountain to climb to develop South Africa economically, yet it did have several advantages. Firstly, it was able to redirect much of the spending which had gone into the military and security services under the National Party towards welfare spending and infrastructure development. Secondly, foreign investment arrived after years of South Africa being boycotted internationally as a result of apartheid, while foreign markets also opened up to South African goods. Finally, the second half of the 1990s was a period of immense economic growth globally, as the end of the Cold War created a truly globalized economy and China's economic miracle began. The government also took action to increase its economic power and better the lot of ordinary South Africans, nationalizing some industries and assets and reforming labor laws to benefit employees and small business owners. Yet progress was still slow, compounded by a rapidly growing population which expanded by nearly 7 million people alone in the decade between when Mandela was released from prison in 1990 up to 2000. Nevertheless, millions of people first obtained access to running water, electricity, basic health care and education during Mandela's term as president, though he has, with a fair degree of legitimacy, been criticized for a failure to address both the spread of HIV AIDS in South Africa and the country's crime problem. One of the key concerns of the government of national unity in the mid-1990s under Mandela's leadership was to devise a new constitution for South Africa in light of the end of apartheid and the enfranchisement of the majority of the population. This was to be a formalization of the interim constitution, which had been agreed in 1993, prior to the elections of 1994. This provided for universal suffrage to elect a 400-member National Assembly, who would then elect a president to serve as both head of state and head of government for a maximum of two terms of five years. In acknowledgement of the quasi-federal nature of the South African state, one in which the Cape provinces of the south of the country have very different demographics and history to other provinces such as KwaZulu-Natal and the Free State further to the northeast, an upper house was also created, one with 90 delegates, 10 from each of the nine provinces into which South Africa was newly divided. Unusually, the constitution also provided for South Africa to effectively have four different capitals. The seat of government was to be in Cape Town, where Parliament would sit. The President and Cabinet would operate out of Pretoria, while the Supreme Court and Constitutional Court would sit in Bloemfontein and Johannesburg, respectively. This unorthodox arrangement was designed to provide symbolic representation to the various communities within South Africa, different parts of which had a closer affinity to different cities. Nevertheless, the new constitution proved unsatisfactory to the National Party, and just weeks after it was enshrined as the new constitution of South Africa, the cleric and his colleagues withdrew from the government of national unity. Mandela established himself during his term as President of South Africa as one of the world's leading statesmen, a curious shift in position after having spent decades being condemned by governments in Washington and London as a terrorist 
In this newfound role, he became one of the leading voices calling for an end to regional conflicts. For instance, he was critical of Israel's actions against Palestine and a firm advocate of the now largely abandoned two-state solution, while he also urged India and Pakistan to develop better relations in the hopes of offsetting a new war between these long-standing adversaries, both of which are nuclear-armed states and which were still in disagreement over the status of the Kashmir region. Closer to home, Mandela played a leading role in mediating an end to the violence in Rwanda, following the end of the civil war there between the Hutus and the Tutsi, though his close relationship with the dictator of Libya, Muammar Gaddafi, does not look good in hindsight. More broadly, Mandela was elected as Secretary General of the Non-Aligned Movement in 1998, the large group of dozens of states which had emerged during the Cold War as a group which wished to remain aloof from the world's major military alliances, such as NATO. Despite the fact that Winnie Mandela had emerged as a leading figure within the ANC herself, one who in the 1990s was viewed as a potential president of South Africa someday in the future, Nelson and she had grown apart quickly after his release from prison in 1990, their relationship understandably strained after nearly 30 years of separation. She was also engaging in an affair, and Nelson was a serial womanizer, whose first marriage had also come to an end on the back of his infidelity. They separated in 1992, and Nelson applied for a divorce in 1995, one which was finalized the following year. His motives in finally seeking a divorce were clear. In 1995, he had begun a relationship with Grasa Machel, the widow of the deceased president of Mozambique between 1975 and 1986, Samora Machel. They eventually married in 1998 on the occasion of Mandela's 80th birthday. They would live a quiet life, and Mandela, despite his position as president and his wider international renown, continued to live a simple life, one largely free of the trappings of wealth, courteous and polite to all. He was also a paradoxically private man who kept his own counsel on many issues. In his later years, he also reveled in his role as a grandfather to 17 grandchildren, while the first of his 19 great-grandchildren had been born in 1984, while he was still in prison. When he became president of South Africa in 1994, Mandela was already in his mid-70s and was suffering from numerous ailments owing to the harsh conditions in which he had lived while imprisoned between the early 1960s and 1990. He had consequently never intended to run for a second term as head of state and had viewed his role primarily as being the individual who would oversee the transition to a post-apartheid South Africa. Moreover, there was a younger generation of ANC members who viewed themselves as being the primary power within the party. None was as powerful as Thabo Mbeki, who had been a member of the ANC since he joined it in 1956 at 14 years of age. He spent much of his adult life up to 1990 abroad studying economics in London and then acting as an ANC representative in various African countries. In 1994, he had been elected as Deputy President of South Africa in conjunction with the Cleric and Deputy President of the ANC. Once the new constitution was in place in 1996, Mandela began transferring control of the government to Mbeki. In 1997, he revealed publicly that Mbeki was effectively in charge of the government, and in December of that year, this new dispensation was formalized when he succeeded Mandela as the leader of the ANC, though Mandela had favored Simul Ramaphosa as his successor. Thus, while Mandela would remain as the official president of South Africa until the end of his five-year term in the summer of 1999, he was already stepping back from the position from 1996 onwards once the new constitution was in place. Following the end of his presidency, Mandela had intended to largely retire from frontline politics, but such was his status as one of the world's foremost and most respective elder statesmen in addition to his own restless nature, that he was soon involved in new initiatives on the African and international stage. In 1999, he established the Nelson Mandela Foundation, 
through which he undertook extensive work in South Africa to try to combat HIV-AIDS, a disease which had, and continues to have, its epicenter there, with prevalence rates significantly exceeding 10% in South Africa. Mandela also had a personal concern for the issue by the late 1990s, as his son, Makato, was suffering from AIDS and would die from the illness in 2005. On the international stage, he also tried to apply pressure on Western nations to improve the economic state of Africa. He was critical of the US-led invasion of Iraq in 2003. While closer to home, he urged Robert Mugabe, the leader who had ascended to power in Zimbabwe after its own white minority rule ended in the late 1970s, to step down as leader of the country. Mugabe and the ZANU-PF party, which he led, in many ways mirrored Mandela and the ANC during their early days, but had diverged enormously from them in the 1980s, with Mugabe becoming the virtual dictator of Zimbabwe and ZANU-PF engaging in acute corruption and human rights abuses. When Mugabe refused to step down, Mandela publicly condemned him. Other notable aspects of Mandela's retirement years included his campaigning for the 2010 Football World Cup to be held in South Africa and his leading role in establishing the Elders in 2007, a collection of prominent, experienced and well-respected former world leaders who would act in conjunction with one another to try to promote world peace and human rights. Despite his continuing activity during the 2000s, Mandela's health was deteriorating. In 2001, he had to undergo treatment for prostate cancer, and in the years that followed, Mandela's aides made it clear that he was only available for public appearances on a limited basis, in line with his health requirements. When the Football World Cup was held in South Africa in the summer of 2010, Mandela could only make a limited number of appearances, despite having campaigned for it to be held in the country. And there was much discussion of his deteriorating health, now being in his early 90s. The following spring, he was hospitalized owing to a respiratory issue, and lung ailments continued over the next two years. It was this which would eventually lead to his death. On the 5th of December 2013, Mandela died at his home in the suburbs of Johannesburg at 95 years of age, a remarkable lifespan for an individual who had endured harsh living conditions for nearly three decades while imprisoned. His body lay in state in Pretoria between the 11th and 13th of December, before a state funeral on the 15th of December, one which was attended by over 100 heads of state from around the world. He was buried in Kunu, near where he was born in the Eastern Cape, on the plot of ground which he had selected himself. He is widely revered today as the father of modern South Africa. Unfortunately, South Africa has not lived up to the ambitions which Mandela held for it in the aftermath of apartheid. On the one hand, the end of apartheid brought it into the fold of fully democratized nations with much improved civil liberties and political transparency. It is also classed today as a newly industrializing nation with one of the largest economies in Africa, but much of this is owing to the comparatively large population of the country which is touching on 60 million today. And the legacy of the wealth which was generated here in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. But there are still vast problems in the country. Crime is endemic. Over half the population live below the poverty line and, most worryingly, the unemployment rate is 30%. The highest official unemployment rate of any African state. Although others probably exceed this unofficially. In addition to this, the ANC, like many parties which assumed power in Africa after revolutionary struggles, has become quite corrupt with many controversies involving senior members of the party in recent times, most notably the country's third post-apartheid president, Jacob Zuma, who was president between 2009 and 2018. Thus, the potential of South Africa in the post-apartheid era has yet to be fully realized. Nelson Mandela is one of the truly iconic figures of the late 20th and early 21st centuries. He is revered today as the individual who led South Africa away from one of the most unjust political systems of the 20th century. There is an element of contradiction here 
as Mandela's early life was one in which he gradually became opposed to European colonialism in Africa and white minority rule in South Africa, to the extent that he was willing to engage in terrorism to overthrow apartheid. But despite his arrest and incarceration for over a quarter of a century in often brutal conditions, he showed no desire to persecute the white minority in South Africa when apartheid was finally overthrown at the end of the Cold War and the ANC finally came to power. Instead, he attempted to build a new South Africa, one which was inclusive of all its people and would look beyond its fractious past. What do you think of Nelson Mandela? Would it have been impossible to bring about an end to apartheid as peacefully had it not been for his leadership and have his successes as leaders of the African National Congress betrayed his legacy? Please let us know in the comment section and in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.